Happy New Year! Oh, Happy you people who are hungover. <laughs> Welcome to the 95th episode of In Class with Carr. Dr. Greg Carr, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. 95. We're almost as old as Betty White. The, uh, I... Wait, no. Should we should we say something? Oh, you know, rest in power, Betty White passed. No she question. crossed over. So many people crossed over like the last few days of the, the year. I did a whole in memoriam before we left the radio. And after, you know, it was like we did it a week before, and then like five more people, you know, Bishop Tutu. I was like, what the hell? Yeah. And then Betty White, she was 17, she was gonna uh Jan January 17th turn 100. And I think she saw all of the things that were gonna be happening, and she was like. I'm good. All right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna control this narrative. Church finger. Church. I'm out. I'll see y'all. Isn't that something? Yeah. Yeah. Control right. the, and control the narrative she did. Uh, you know, um, I know this space is our space, you know. Yeah. There, there are few people that you know well, we're human I, in the world, we can comment right. on anything exactly. But you know, growing up with golden girls and all of this, and then you know, all these stories now about Arthur Duncan and how she fought for him to be on and then got her show canceled I in the 1950s. That. Um, you know, it was really heartwarming. But she was one of those people that I think, you know, even the the, the Snickers commercial, you know, like uh couldn't didn't have like a negative, you know, some people you look at and you're like you know, but Betty White always seemed to be very um, nice, seemed to be a very, very nice woman. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny, isn't it? I mean, particularly in the the era that we're in now, that 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 story, as you say, has been circulating. It's almost as if everybody now has to have some black card or, or black card in their deck to, to earn their legitimacy. And the simple fact of the matter is, I mean, like August Wilson said, you know, I'm not writing for a black or white audience. I'm writing out of black experiences and there's a universality there. Um, I've often heard uh, Dr. Karinga in an in interview about Kwanzaa see, say, this, say this all the time. He said, when you see something that speaks to universal principles, he said, it, it starts with something that's very specific. And our, and our and Du Bois said that over a century ago in the conservation of races. We have something that's very specific in our experiences and we speak to the world and people find themselves in the specific experiences of other people. Bishop Tutu, in fact, said that I was watching his funeral this morning um, in uh, Cape Town in, in, in the church where he was the archbishop and just watching the people talk. And, you know, of course, COVID restrictions had uh, restricted the number of people. But um, there was a quote that Bishop Tutu said, you know, he said, many people ask me. What I've learned from all the experiences I've had in my life, and I say unhesitatingly, people are wonderful. It is true. People really are wonderful. Now, that's aspirational, partially, because he's saying that in the middle of an apartheid system that tried to kill him and a lot of people. But then you look at that church this morning, uh, about about maybe two or three o'clock in the morning, I'm watching the live stream, his daughter, um, you know, all the officials, the, the whole church there with their deep structural hypocrisy. And there was a plain wooden casket, which is the tradition, you know, uh, there um, in his tradition. And the archbishop is laying there and, you know, a diminutive man, small in stature, a little small casket there. And they had the overhead shot. And you could see there in the nave of the church. And I've been in that church to taking students in that church. In fact, went to church service in that church. And so I knew exactly the dimensions. And but. You know, he is credited, as we talked about last week, of coining the term the rainbow people of God. And we know that South Africa has been a deep structural failure or success, depending on if you're trying to exploit people or if you're trying to build a different kind of society. But the people there were across the full range. And the night before I watched uh, the public celebration of his life at Cape Town uh, City Hall, where I've been as well. The choir, you know, it's South Africa has always been fascinating to me for any number of reasons. One of which is that I think a lot of a lot of the reason that a lot of folk in the diaspora, particularly Africans from the United States, are comfortable in South Africa is because it in many ways is indistinguishable from the United States. So you leave like we would leave from D.C., leave from John Foster Dulles and arrive at um, Oliver Tambo 
International Airport in Johannesburg long enough to get our luggage and swap out for a plane to Cape Town. You land in Cape Town at night, you get into Cape Town, and the you know, next morning we get up and we hit the ground running. We had class every day and we go somewhere every day, everywhere, and just crisscrossing the country as far as we could. But when you're in Cape Town, there are parts of Cape Town that you would think were San Francisco. I mean, it has that kind of, I mean, so I think that, and then you go into Kyalisha or you go into Langa. I don't know what you're saying. I mean, you know what I'm saying? So I think there's some, so when you see that last night, I was watching, I said, this could have been in San Francisco. This could have been uh, Radio City Music Hall, but the essence is different. Go ahead. Well, you, something no, going no, I was, I was going to say, and perhaps because apartheid is very much similar to America's Jim Crow, um, Nuremberg, you know, that blackness is galvanizing. And so the people, you know, we were talking a little bit about evolution. I think the last the last class, well, at least I was, brought mm -hmm. up. You know, the half has never been told, and I think mm -hmm. uh, blackness evolves in a space where it has no choice, where mm -hmm. it can't be something else other, and and then all of those tribes with different, you know, because we're all different, That's but right. but there's one galvanizing factor that forces us into this space with one another, and then we evolve into a a, a different thing. So within Africa, you have a lot of colonization, but apartheid is something quite similar to what we experience in America. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. It, it really is. And it's so funny you said it. a couple of things come to mind. I'm looking for yesterday's Financial Times. I might have put it up, but there was a there was a you know, we're in the season now where they have here. Maybe it's in this still in my bag there. We're in the season now where. They talk now about the books. Here are the coming books that are the oh, yes. books. You know. Hundred books that we're supposed to read or something. Exactly. What and happened? always, you know, depending on the publication, it really does let you know what the agenda is. And FT, of course, which is one of the uh, papers of record for the world. I can't see. And, and, and because F Financial Times is uh, anchored in Great Britain, I mean, it comes out of Europe. And so a lot of the books that it previews aren't going to appear um, like I held up a book, but I held up a book and I'm sure he's here with us this morning um, that has been published in the UK, but not in the United States yet. As I went looking for it, I hadn't seen the book and then realized, OK, there's usually a lag time, maybe several months. And there are two books that are coming out. I look forward to uh, reading one by Deepo uh, Faloyan. It's called uh, Africa is not a country. That and I'm saying, okay, I see why y'all want to see this one. Uh, Financial Times, uh, Deepo Falonian challenges us to recognize the vast diversity of the continent, and then they have that group with another book by uh, Chinua uh, Ukata and Astrid Madimba. It's called It's a Continent, and it's public coming out in July. It says the subject of race is addressed. Um, oh, also, uh, Essie Idugyan out of the sun, but the point is that. At least those first two books emphasizing the diversity of Africa is, it, I mean, I think of a book that came out many years ago. I want to say uh, uh, Brother Kasahun Chikoli at Africa World Press published this many years ago. It's called Africa is not a country. Africa is a continent, not a country, combining ironically the two names of these books that are forthcoming this year. And it was it, it's a book for children. It's a book with maps, some things you can color, puzzle games, and it was published here in the United States. It's all over the world. I've seen that book in, ironically, bookstores in Cape Town. In fact, my favorite bookstore in Cape Town, shout out South Africans, uh, Clark's Bookshop, uh, downtown Cape Town. They always look out for me when I'm, when I'm there. Um, but at any rate, it is to send the message to young people, particularly, that Africa is very diverse. However, it is Africa. And I and, and I suspect that these books have made their way into the Financial Times must read because there's, there's an attempt by Europe always and whiteness always generally as a social structure concept to elevate the diversity of blackness because it keeps in their mind the idea. And by they, I mean those who benefit from keeping people uh, thinking of themselves as so different. It benefits the very unified worldview mm. that allows people to exploit other people by saying, you know, when I hear people say, oh, the black community is not a monolith and they sit back all satisfied and like, yeah, 
the human community is not a monolith. What are you saying? It's like people say Kwanzaa is a made up holiday. Yeah, there's, they're all made up. What's your point? What you're really trying to get at is you black people stop trying to get together. <laughs> so when you when you say that about the, the, the diversity, it reminds me in terms of uh, of uh, Arch uh, Bishop Tutu. He wrote the preface of one of the many editions of this book. And we talked about this brother a little while ago, Steve Biko. This is one of the editions of our right. What I like, I actually got this one in South Africa. Um, it was published uh, by Picador Africa Press. And one of the reasons I bought this copy one time when I was there was that um, it has an introduction by um, Nkosanati Biko. Nkosanati is one of Steve Biko's children. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Nkosanati. Um, I read a paper at the Steve Biko conference. I told that story before when we brought students to South Africa in 2007. And I showed them how to write an abstract for a journal or for a conference. And we were practicing that in class. And I had used as the example a call for papers that had appeared in that morning's papers, Cape Town papers that I had read early that morning. And so I brought it to class. I showed them and I said, let's let's practice this. And, sent, and I said, well, I'll do it with y'all. So we were doing it together. And then I just, you know, I emailed my abstract to the conference. And next thing you know, they had invited me. So I came back. In fact, one of the uh, people who became ancestors this year who was at that conference, who I got a chance to sit with and listen to and talk and actually had and had a conversation with was um, the president of uh, uh, Kaunda, Kenneth Kaunda, KK, um, and um, Zambia, the former president of Zambia, the first president of independent Zambia. And in fact, it was Kenneth Kaunda who, when Nelson Mandela and Oliver, uh, Nelson Mandela and um, Govan and Becky, um, Walter Sisulu, Ahmed Kathrada, all those folks that they locked up on Robin Island were breaking limestone in the quarry. It was Govan and Becky's son, Tabo, who was a little boy at the time. While these cats are up in the, literally in this limestone quarry, out of the sight of the guards, plotting on how they're going to run the country when they take the country over. Now, they, they've been, <laughs> it is remorse. To, these guys are in pure captivity on Robin Island. And they're plotting what they're going to do when they win and take over the country. This is decades before that happens. And Govan and Becky's son, Thabo, was a little boy. It was KK. It was Kenneth Kaunda. It was President Kaunda in neighboring Zambia who was able to sneak Thabo and them out the country. And Thabo and Becky, of course, was raised in, among other places, London in Great Britain. And the school there. And of course, and Becky comes back to the continent. Uh, is one of the leaders of the negotiations for the transfer of power and lives to become the second president of Free South Africa after Nelson Mandela, all set up in part because Kenneth Kaunda came to get him. So I got a chance to, to hear that story mouth to, mouth to ear from Kenneth Kaunda himself in that Biko conference. Um, but uh, I should add that he also lived, Tabo and Becky, to become an object of deep criticism by, as we talked about last week, Desmond Tutu, who said, Look, we expected this from the white people in the apartheid government. What we didn't expect was deep inequality coming from our side. So this African National Congress that I never would join and told all my priests, y'all can't join a political party, even as we were in the streets side by side with y'all. Now we turn our criticism to you because we expect something different from you. But the reason I bought this edition was that um, when I met in Kosanati, it was at the Biko conference and in Kosanati wrote the introduction to this edition of his father's work. But not only that, the preface was written by Archbishop Tutu. And people might think, well, Tutu was a um, man of God and Steve Biko was talking about black consciousness. Uh, Tutu, as we talked about last week, was the chair of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission where the people who killed Steve Biko came in there and said what had happened. And a lot of South Africans, millions of South Africans, millions of continental African South Africans, I distinguish the black South Africans, the South Africans from the people born in South Africa who were the children of the settlers, um, like that actress in Hollywood whose name I could remember but don't want to at this moment. But at any rate, among others, by the way, oh, Elon Musk, and he's South African, yeah, yep. uh, you know, but uh, yeah, while well, he's trying to figure out how to leave us here. But the uh, Tutu in his preface is very short, he he thanks the black consciousness movement. People said, well, Steve Biko and them were for the Black Consciousness Movement. Yes, the Black Consciousness Movement. And by the way, Steve Biko, in fact, the reason that they had this conference that, that I attended in uh, 2007, uh, 
it was called the reason they had it was it was the 30th anniversary of Steve Biko's murder by the South African police. And he was 30 years old when he died. So it was the Biko 3030 conference. And, you know, in Becky actually spoke at that conference. I remember correctly. In fact, in Gugi Watiango, the following year gave a, a talk at the conference is a major kind of convening uh, Jerry Rollins who made transition not too long ago. Actually, during the COVID pandemic, who was the president of Ghana, he and his wife were there. There's a lot of complicated, layered, contradictory, often uh, conversations around leadership in Africa during the independence movement. But at any rate, um, it's interesting because the black consciousness movement that Biko was a part of really embraced the political definition of blackness. So, yes, we have all these differences, differences in cultural location and language, differences in geography, but ultimately... Black for Biko and his comrades, the women and men who were part of his uh, um, group and this movement was really also about politics. What are your politics? They looked at blackness as an expanded concept that, that could transcend even your place of origin. So there were people we would call Indians from the Indian subcontinent whose ancestors had been absconded to South Africa by the Europeans from, from the Indian subcontinent who were considered black in the black consciousness movement. And if you all, a second ago, I mentioned uh, uh, an Indian South African who, you know, I also had the honor of meeting a couple of times when he would come to the States, uh, Ahmed Kathrada or Kathy, as they uh, recall him, if y'all remember that, if you've even, even if you've only, if you read Nelson Mandela's, uh, uh, biography, autobiography, you know him, or even his own writings, Ahmed Katrada. But if you, um, even if the only thing you've seen, if that was that uh, movie with Idris Elba on Mandela, um, then you remember the the Indian prisoner who was on Robin Island with them, Ahmed Katrada, who they called Kathy. Um, but at any rate, he was, he, he, see, Biko and I said, well, he black too. There was a lot of Indian members of the black consciousness movement. You see a similar definition emerging in Great Britain during this period, particularly the anti-apartheid movement, the 1980s and 90s. But this is what, this is what Bishop Tutu would have to say in his intro, in his preface to this uh, collection of Steve Biko's writings, I Write What I Like. A man who people would say, well, you're different, uh, Tutu. You're different. You and Mandela are different from Biko and them. Those guys are they said, oh, no, don't be trying to make us all separate. We know we have different political philosophies, a little bit different, and we come to different places. But what we're not going to do is let you emphasize our differences as a political tactic, as you always emphasize your similarities. When they, when you read the newspaper and they say the international community condemns, who is the international community? Oh, you're talking about Great Britain, France, the EU, United States. Uh-huh. Yeah, Canada. Uh-huh. Okay, well, in Haiti, we're going to come. No, no, y'all have a lot of differences now. Y'all don't never talk about differences. I mean, we're going to get to that. We talk a little bit in a minute about what's going on in Chile. But this is what Bishop Tutu says. I think black consciousness has, in fact, not quite completed its task. So-called black on black violence would not have occurred, even if, as seems more and more to be the case, it was instigated and fueled by an unscrupulous and sinister third force had we said that we respected one another and would not permit anyone or for whatever reason and whatever the reward to manipulate us or inveigle us into slaughtering one another as happened just before our historic elections of April 27th, 1994, particularly in KwaZulu Natal where violence had become so tragically endemic. We would have said that each of us is too precious to become a pawn in a bloody game. It is good that there is this new addition to enable us to savor the inspired words of Steve Biko. Perhaps it could just spark a black renaissance. And he, he this is the last paragraph in his uh, preface, but he precedes that by thanking Biko and thanking his comrades for this black con consciousness movement because he said reconciliation needed black consciousness to succeed because reconciliation is a deeply personal thing happening between those who acknowledge their unique personhood and those who have it acknowledged by others. But that last paragraph was important to me because I just read a story. My adopted hometown of Philly 
these cats in here shooting it and killed a bunch of people in this shootout. And the first thing people do is they see black on black violence, black on black violence. People people put their hands on people who are closest to us. So we in, in, in space, which means, you know, when people say black on black violence, what you're really saying is this is American apartheid. People are in these communities by race because you designed it that way and then kept it that way and exacerbated it. But that's not to miss the point Biko is uh, um that uh, Tutu is making about Biko and Black consciousness, which is part of Black consciousness is looking at each other and saying, I recognize your humanity and that I will not lay hands on you because your life is as precious to me as my life. And one of the things today and yesterday they raised in terms of uh, uh, Bishop Tutu was this concept of Ubuntu, Ubuntu, peopleness, peopleness, peoplehood. The idea that we are family, familyhood really is the translation. Um, when we talk about nation, what they really mean is people, family, people tied together by a commitment to each other's humanity, whether by blood or by choice, the families we choose. And, and so it's interesting because diversity is seen as a value in the United States of America, at least a rhetorical value. But we don't often pa we pause to consider that it wasn't diversity that allowed us to survive the traumas. In fact, it was the creation of unity of Umoja, the first principle of Kwanzaa, that allowed us to survive. So I thought we, I'm glad you raised that question of diversity. Listen, Let me, uh, I just want people to know this is not scripted uh, no, at all. And, no. they, uh, and it's faith that keeps us. It's, it's the understanding and the in the knowledge, the internal knowledge, the knowing that we will get there. We will get there together. Um, and today is, is Imani, the last Imani. day of Kwanzaa. Um, so I guess that's also appropriate. Uh, yeah. I um, We should read the definition right quick. To believe okay. with all our hearts and our people, our parents, our teachers, our leaders, and the righteousness and victory of our struggle. Imani. Oh, come on back. Yeah. No, repeat that. Repeat it. To believe. With all our hearts, this is this critical, to believe with all our hearts and our people, our parents, our teachers, our leaders, and the righteousness and victory of our struggle. Yeah. Every day Kwanzaa, 2022, every single day, Kwanzaa every principles day. will be living out, especially in Nubia, but you know, yeah, uh, in all of our lives, that should be it. All right. So, uh, Carl and Urias, we had a meeting this week, and uh, I don't know if it was Carl or Urias found a video, uh, which I thought would be really interesting to play today since it's the first day of January. And I want to share it. I'm going to share share my screen. Uh, and it's very interesting. And I want your your feedback on it as we we do this. Oh, uh, oh, yeah. my God. Yeah. yeah. Do you no. know this guy? What are you? <laughs> What are you doing? Oh, this is your moment. I know it's, it y'all can't this hear it probably because this is not a dialogue between who minor figures on the African intellectual landscape, not of the past decade or generation, but of the past century, not of the past century. But this is a dialogue between African intellectuals who are giants in their own right since our forced departure from our home. And with that, what I want to do is uh First, I guess, set the ground rules that they're agreeable, these gentlemen. <laughs> I had your permission, Elder, to continue. I take it. Yes, sir. Dr. Webb, you ready to go? All right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in the words of Dr. Webb, uh, Patricia Williams and uh, Susan Stewart's uh, voice literary something in October 1992, there's going to be no voyeurism here. We're at home. That's right. This is Rashad. This isn't any place else where there's non African. This is a family discussion. Dr. 
All right, all right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I always uh, smoke. What's wrong? <laughs> first of all, uh, uh, you were very skinny. Look at yeah. tall and skinny, very skinny. Uh, yeah. Yeah. voice the same, same, mm. the same. This, you know, the the beauty of watching that is, um, you know, some people like there's a, a I think Mankin said, um willful uh consistency is a hobgoblin of little minds or something but there's mm. something to be said about consistency in thought uh and then building on that and consistency and delivering consistency and commitment to to a cause to a people mm. uh and i don't know how old that is but mm. what this is the first verses y'all the first the real verses uh cornell west Versus John Henry Clark, who was yeah. born this day in 1915. It's his birthday, yeah. Today is his birthday. Mm. And they had an intellectual battle that you moderated. Yeah. yeah. When, what, what, what was this? That was, oh, man. Oh, that was 1994. I want to say 94. So I was, what, 29? I think it may have been the last time I had a town. But uh, <laughs> it looked like you were straight from the fruit of Islam. Well, yeah, I mean, if I was gonna wear by the end, if I was wearing ties, it was bow ties. That was a kid, I was a kente bow tie. Fact, uh, that was yeah, that was a long time ago. <laughs> that was yeah, actually, that was Ohio State, Ohio State okay. University. By then, I was at Temple University. Uh, you know, I, we, had, we had finished my master's program, we had gone to Temple, and Dr. Clark. Interestingly enough, and I tell you, you tell this story. There are people obviously still around to tell that tale. Um, Dr. West Cornell had been invited to come to Ohio State to give a talk at, at the university, I think at the Wexler Center, uh, one of the big auditoriums on Ohio State's campus. And Ohio State at that time, I think it was between Ohio State and University of Texas, the biggest university in the country. Ohio State is always in that tier. Um, so he had agreed and the students found out he was coming because he he hadn't been contracted to come by the black students by the frank w hale black cultural center i look i encourage you all to look up frank hale this brother is the reason that i came to ohio state in fact uh dr frank hale he his autobiography his memoir is called angel on my shoulder frank hale was at one time the president of oakwood uh college in alabama and Seventh Day Adventist School, and he was recruited to Ohio State uh, in the 70s, 1970s, to come and become vice president for what became the Office of Minority Affairs to increase diversity, so to speak, at Ohio State. There is absolutely nothing that we're talking about now that is new. Absolutely nothing. Anti-racism, diversity, equity, inclusion, all of that, none of it is new, which is why it is stunning to see the current generation of champions of these topics never ever seize on the momentum of memory which always makes me suspect of their motives everybody so, wants to be labeled this is what you know uh my my people perish for, because of lack of vision but also because of lack of memory like this yes. this thing was done on purpose to us to to strip us of name culture understanding history all of that that's right. It's our. It has to be our everyday waking mission to remember. That's right. That that has to be like at the top oh. of every to remember. Say it. Say so, it. So take it. You know when they played that video uh, in our meeting on Wednesday, and I saw you stand up there. <laughs> I'm like, first of all, you've been doing this a long time. Yeah, that was. Um, but to to be in the room moderating John Henry Clark and Cornell West, who's been doing this a long time. Yes. Who's still here. Yes. Still part of what we we do here in Nubian, and yes. I want to thank him for for joining us on, you know, just like yes, yes. Cornell was younger then than we are now when he did that. I don't know if he was fifty yet. He may have been fifty one, fifty two. Yeah, yeah. Wow, yeah. wow. In fact, wow. that was just after Race Matters had come out, and then his book Keeping Faith. At the time, he was uh, his wife at the time was Ethiopian. And he was writing about in the beginning of his uh, collection of essays called Keeping Faith about being a New World African, which I brought up, by the way, in that conversation. Uh, so 
yeah, he, he, the reason I the reason I raised Dr. Hale's name in that context is because we were standing in the Frank Hale Cultural Center, which was the black which is the Black Cultural Center on campus. In fact, that building is no longer there. That building had been converted from a commons. Uh, at Ohio State, they had cafeterias. They were sometimes referred to as commons, which would be freestanding buildings, big building. And the black students in the 1960s who protested at Ohio State, which led to the black student movement of the 1970s at Ohio State, had demanded uh, that they, they have a black cultural center. And eventually that black cultural center uh, was given to the black students and that building was converted into the Frank W. Hale Black Culture Center. And that happened around, I think I was still in law school at the time. So that went around 19, maybe the fall of 1989, spring of 1990. And then they had a flagpole outside. <laughs> Man, you bring back memories. They had a flagpole outside the building and they had the American flag. Well, we then protested and said, y'all can take that American flag now. And we put up the red, black and green flag. And by the way, red, black and green flags and flagpoles have been a source of battle on college campuses for many, many years. In fact, uh, every every year or two, couple of years, you would see at Howard University, the American flag somehow disappear from the flagpole and you get up on campus in the morning and there'd be a red, black and green flag flying from the flagpole. Uh, after the student protests of 1968, 67, 68, there was a compromise struck and talk about not having memory the red, black, and green flag was then, uh, it was the agreement was made for the red, black, and green flag to fly over the flagpole that is on the library, the Founders Library, the iconic Founders Library on campus. Uh, that has not happened in decades because what happens is students come and go. Administrations count on people to forget and say, so don't mess with that flag on the American flag on the flagpole and the Howard flag, but that red, black, and green flag can fly over there to the library. It has not flown in years, certainly not the 20 years I've been there. However, mm. every few couple of years, you would see, again, that red, black, and green flag go up that flagpole until uh, the current administration, at which point locks were placed on the flagpole uh, so that you can't take the flag down or put the flag up because that ain't going to happen again. But I suspect at some point it will go back up. But uh, the flagpole in front of the Frank Hale Culture Center, the agreement was made, the concession, and they took that American flag away and that red, black, and green flag went up in front of that flagpole. And so when I became a graduate assistant, uh, when I graduated from law school, went over to my master's program in, in Black Studies, now African and African American Studies at Ohio State, uh, I got a job. <clears throat> I was teaching. I was a teaching assistant in Ohio State. I mean, you talk to classes, but I also got a job as the graduate assistant, one of the graduate assistants at the Frank Hale Black Culture Center, because as I said, Dr. Hale, after he was recruited by Ohio State to come to the Ohio State University, as they like to call it, from Alabama, where he had been a sitting college president, it was a move Ohio State made because the students and the faculty, the black faculty, the black students, the black staff, the black community in Columbus, Ohio, in that period of the black student movement of the 70s, put so much hate on them. They said, well, we got to get somebody to help us before they these, these people burn up the damn campus. Frank Hale agreed to what is essentially a demotion of sorts uh, from leading a school to coming and working on the staff of another school. And he created something called the Black uh, Visitation Days, Black Graduate Visitation Days, where Ohio State paid for the top five students from every Black college that would participate. And this grew to a huge thing. It still goes on to this day. You, black colleges were asked to find their top five students, invite them to spend the better part of a week, including a weekend, on the campus of Ohio State University, where they would then be vetted, where they would then visit the graduate and professional schools of their choice. And after scrutiny and conversations and tours, they would then, many of them, be invited to apply to Ohio State University. This is in a long line of kind of picking up bargains, frankly, that schools in the North, particularly the um, well, I won't say particularly to the Midwest because it happened on the East Coast as well and out in the West Coast as well. But the Big Ten schools would do this for graduate and professional students of African descent who, of course, for 
uh, since the beginning of public HBCUs in particular, but since the beginning of HBCUs in the South up until the end of formal end of apartheid were barred from attending white schools in the South. And of course, this is the, the legal cases. We've talked about that before. Lloyd Gaines, the University of Missouri, Missouri X Rail Gaines. Um, the famous cases where Charles Hamlin Houston and those guys, Thurgood Marshall and them, they attacked the graduate and professional schools first because those were smaller and you could do them with surgical precision. So rather than go to try to integrate the undergraduate student body at the University of Texas, they attacked the law school, the famous case of Sweat versus Painter, Hyman Sweat. Um, and his colleagues and comrades, including one of my jagness, the great Jacob Carruthers, who integrated the University of Texas Austin Law School. So they didn't go for the student body undergrads, they went for the law school. But even though they were successful in Sweat versus Painter and, and, and then basically drove Hyman Sweat out and Jacob Carruthers said, I ain't going with this. He went to University of uh, Colorado, transferred, went to UC, uh, University of Colorado, got a PhD in political science, the first black person to do that. These schools in the North, would pick up bargains because the South would pay. They would say, okay, James Ashley Donaldson, Lincoln University graduate out of Florida, you can't come get a PhD at the University of Florida in your home state. So we'll pay for you to go to the University of Illinois, Big Ten School. And that's how uh, Dean Donaldson, my dean, who hired me at, at, at Howard, G James Ashley Donaldson got a PhD in math at the University of Illinois at age 26 because U, U of I recruited him out because he couldn't go to school in Florida. You saw that happen at the University of Iowa, Big Ten. You saw that happen at the University of Michigan, Big Ten. You saw that happen at Michigan State, Big Ten. You saw that happening at all these Big Ten schools and Ohio State was one of those schools. With two of my Jagnas, uh, one of whom was an ancestor, McDonald Williams, the other who is still kicking uh, 103 now, the great Jamie Coleman Williams, first woman to edit the African Methodist Episcopal Church Review. Um, she uh, is now living in Atlanta. They both went to Ohio State. So when Frank Hale came to Ohio State in the 70s and set up this Black Graduate and Professional Visitation Days, he understood that here was a pipeline I can basically turn into a highway. So he was the mastermind behind creating a highway of black students who came out of the South largely, who went to Ohio State University in every field, medicine, dentistry, law, all the graduate programs, social work, this was Frank Hill. And so um, that's how I ended up at Ohio State. I'll never forget the day they brought me the application for Harvard Law. And they said, you know, you should apply for Harvard. And I was like, no, nah, I'm going to Ohio State. But you're not going to apply to these other schools? No, nah. why? Because Dr. Mack went there, Dr. Jamie went there, Frank Hale invited me up there to come, and I came with the students, so I feel I gave it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. I never think in terms of whatever this label is to you, I have a label on myself. Why? I am my mother and father's son. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Harvard don't mean nothing to me. <laughs> you understand? I'm going because I know who's there, and again, I didn't have a language for it then, the language you use now. In the social structure, you probably should have gone to Harvard or tried to go to Harvard. In the governance structure, who are we to each other? I know my people up there, and I know my people who came through there, and I don't give a damn about a Buckeye, as y'all heard me say there. You know, I went to Tennessee State. I came through here, but I don't claim none of that. Then they all started laughing. <laughs> Why? Because give me my paper and let me keep going. I ain't going to no football games. I ain't wearing no Buckeyes around my neck. And every athlete come in my classes, I'm trying to remind them that you are here because of the sacrifice of other people. Get this lesson in this class. I don't give a damn what them coaches telling y'all to practice. And that ended up being a problem for them. But anyway, that momentum, those black students, those black faculty like Charles Mwanza Ross, like William Nelson, Nick Nelson in, in Black Studies, those faculty and staff, Teresa Drummond at the Black Culture Center, my man Larry Williamson from Philly, uh, from Philly area, we call him Cheese Steak Williamson, who is now the director of the Frank Hale Center, one of Hale's early recruits. They didn't ask Cornell to come. They were glad he came, but they hadn't made that invitation. That invitation came from the university, again, because during that period, you know how they do. You know how universities do. You know, we, we may not solve the problems of black and brown students and oppressed people on this campus. We, we may pay the staff uh, terrible wages. We may, but every February, we're going to spend to bring some black people in to talk loud and be like rah-rah. And then it, so when the students found out that Cornell was coming. Now, I'm in Philly now. I graduated. And my man said, I'm going on to get the PhD. They called me like, do you think you can get Dr. Clark <laughs> to come to uh, to debate Cornell West? 
well, and they told me, okay, he, Cornell is speaking this night. Okay. So if, if he says yes, we're going to ask him if he'll stay to debate Dr. Clark. It's okay. So I called, John, I called Dr. Clark. And John Clark, by the way, it is his birthday. We'll talk a little bit more of that in a minute. And we've talked about this before, but it's always good because one of the things that you say, we don't have the, the momentum of memory. But if you go back in the archive, now that we're approaching our hundredth, you'll see we had a long conversation about John Clark. And I'll just mention uh, Anna Swanson, the elder who's still alive, who wrote, who was Dr. Clark's assistant, who wrote a book on John Henry Clark. Uh, here over there. I mentioned it in, in earlier, our earlier talk about Clark. But uh, I called at night. And see, here's the thing. At night, Dr. Clark answered his phone because his help wasn't there at the house up on 137th Street um, in Harlem. And the thing about it is, you know, Dr. Clark couldn't see. I mean, he was beyond legally blind. Dr. Clark was very, you know, and this was at the time before, you know, 9-11, when you go to the airport. You, and Dr. Clark traveled alone often. He flew to Columbus after we had got everything where I had come in, come in from Philly, driven in from Philly the day before. So I'm, I went and got him, you know, took him to the hotel, stayed with him, you know, brought him over to. I mean, because he couldn't, you know, see. So if you call him at night, he gonna answer, probably answer, be the one answering the phone. Hello. So we talked and I said, these young people want you to come to, uh, to, to, to Columbus to debate Cornell West. He said, OK. I said, they got money. So I know how you are. And he was, you know, and, and he wasn't alone, but, and he's not alone in this, you know, money wasn't the issue. Don't worry about that. You know, they give me, you know, pay for the flight and give me a hotel room, whatever. I'm good. Now nah, that Clark, you charge these people. This is a, this one of the biggest, if not the biggest university in the country, they got money, got a budget and they scared too. So these black kids gonna get you some money. All right. So he said, okay. So I gave him his number. They called, they figured out the contract. And uh, my friend, uh, Aya Fubara, who's uh, she and her family live in Texas now. She was an undergraduate at the time. She ended up going to law school at Ohio State as well. Um, her folk, Igbo, Nigerian, uh, not Igbo, um, Ibibio, the smaller group. And, but, she's a, and she's a Nubian. And she is a Nubian, right. She's probably watching this morning because she and her family, they celebrate, they go hard on Kwanzaa. They celebrate Kwanzaa hard. So daughter of of africa very much so very active in nubia so she was undergrad time so they they negotiating so they call me okay we got he's coming cornell has agreed they're going to debate the next day all right so i called out a clark back did you charge him john Henry clark said to me i told him whatever they paying cornell west pay me half what and it was still the biggest money he said it was the biggest money he ever got in a check to come somewhere and talk. And that's not a that's not a criticism of anything or anybody, but the process, because this is the politics of this thing we get find ourselves caught up in. You know, I have a lot of friends and colleagues. Cornell is not one of them, but I have a lot of friends and colleagues who were referred to Black History Month as jokingly as Green History Month, because that's when they get paid. So you see them at the Martin Luther King lecture or you see them at the Black History Month lecture at this university. But they got a check and they got a nice check. I mean, they got, you know what I'm saying, you know, and, and at that time, you know, but anyway, Clark said, whatever they're paying him, give me half. And, and I don't even think Cornell knows that. I don't think I ever told him that story. But anyway, we got it together. We came. What you showed there, that, that, first, that was the opening. Uh, you saw the bottle there because uh, I poured libation. There were a lot of people there from the Columbus community. There were uh, the administrators were there. The students were there. Cornell sitting on one side. John Henry Clark sitting on the other side. Cornell had spoken the night before. John Clark had spoken the night before to the black community. They didn't go to the Ohio State uh, uh, discussion. And what I said there in that little clip, everybody, if y'all couldn't hear it. So, you know, this ain't a performance. This is not performance because, of course, there were some black students who did go. And then they came back and told everybody what was taught, discussed. And one of the things that Cornell brought up, as he always brings up, is the kind of range of people who struggled with Black people in the liberation struggle in the United States. And he focused specifically on, as he would say, Brother John Brown, ironically. 
So as you probably watched that that discussion, I mean, they told Dr. Clark that. And so as the debate begins, one of the things Clark said was, because, you know, Cornell being as always, you know, building bridges, community, everything. See, Mr. Clark, when I was a student in New York, we used to come sit at your feet when I was a union seminary and we would come up town and fit. And Clark said, yeah, yeah. He said, now I wonder why when you talk about John Brown, you didn't mention Shields Green, <laughs> who said, I think I'll go with the old man. John Clark went straight for the juggler. He said, now you talking about John Brown, that's great. But you know, there were black men that died at Harper's Ferry. And we tell y'all, we talked about all of those guys when we, we, we talked about the book Five for Freedom, Shields Green, Dangerfield Newby. Clark making the point that I get the need, desire for us to all be together and move forward in liberation struggles, but never when you're going to raise the name of a white person, forget that black people were always on the front line because it was our lives in the dock. And it was a very kind of subtle thing. And it never got contentious. I think, let me say one other thing about it. I think the closest it got to being a little contentious was when the subject of Dr. Karinga came up. Because, you know, Malana Karinga has been in decades of conversation with formations in the world and in this country that might be labeled as Marxists, certainly socialists, like Democratic Socialists of America. Cornel West, uh, I think both of them members at one time, if not still, the Democratic Socialists of America, they used to have a conference. They, they still do have a conference, but it was in New York for years and they would come together. And so Cornell made a comment about needing to get beyond ideological differences to, you know, united front, very important observation. And Clark said, well, I find it difficult with Karinga because he tortured black women. You could have heard a pen drop. See, yeah, I don't know about it. And then I think, oh, who, who was, I forget who was on that camera. They kept swinging back and they swung over to Cornell. Cornell's like, uh, yeah. now here's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> because I hear this a lot with critics of Kwanzaa. Who, who just make me laugh when it, I, I mean, I laugh about this because, you know, Dr. Clark, I mean, what was it, Dr. Clark? I was looking at something the other day John Henry Clark was saying. He's, you know, he's had so many speeches that are out there now, which you used to be like gold to get a John Henry Clark lecture on tape. Now, of course, everything is everywhere. But I think you said something like any system in the world will work for you. If you make it work for you, any religion in the world can serve you if you make it serve you. But a religion without spirituality is not worth your time. And, and religion in many cases has torn down spirituality. And Clark was talking about that in the context of those who get so ideologically rigid that they reject everything. And then he says, I know a lot of black Marxists, but I'm not sure if they're Karl Marxists. Or Harpo Marxists. In fact, he said, I think they're probably Harpo Marxists. <laughs> but they seem to be enthralled with this ideology instead of asking the fundamental question of how did your people organize their societies? He said, and he used to call Marx all kind of names. He's Johnny Come Lately, Huckster. I mean, all kind of things. Anyway, but 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 Cornell was trying to make the point that you know we should and can embrace and organize with as many people as possible when we have a common objective and we should be and clark said i draw the line at karinga and they got into a little bit of back and forth not unfriendly but it was difficult because for a couple of reasons dr karinga has made an incredible contribution to even how we think about things his his philosophy and i would encourage folk to read him his philosophy really is anchored in synthesis. That's his whole concept of Kawaida, uh, the philosophy which really out of which comes in Guzo Saba and the principles of Kwanzaa. Uh, and th that is not to say that a whole lot of people did not contribute because a whole lot of people did contribute to the foundations of Kwanzaa there, particularly in the Bay Area. He was in Southern California, kind of at first initially as a representative of some called the African American Association. If y'all go back and look at the one of the conversations we had about Kamala Harris and her and her parents in the Bay Area. Uh, there was a sister who they called the Queen Mother of Kwanzaa. She made transition a few years ago. Uh, her papers are now have been acquired. I think they're in the state archives of California. 
And there are there are memos in there that go back as early as 1967, where she's developing the principles of Kwanzaa and talking about Kwanzaa. There's a lot of people involved in that. But I'm, I'm saying I have to say this. One of Karinga's strengths is his capacity to engage in historical narratives and traditions, including learning languages, Medinetra, Yoruba, uh, and, and then using that as a platform and a foundation for opening up new concepts for us to engage, because everybody's not going to do that level of study. In fact, in some ways, it's kind of in the same vein of what we're doing with these conceptual categories. Everybody's not going to spend their whole life reading and studying. And so those of us for whom that is our primary focus, you know, one of our jobs is to absorb as much as we can. And then in conversation with others and then keep widening that conversation, begin to present some of these things in the contemporary era where folk can grasp them and then engage in study at their level of ability, not even ability, time really is what it's about. And begin to think. Well, Karinga is very strong at that. I mean, you look at those seven principles of Kwanzaa, those aren't just labels, those aren't just names. It's a lot of thinking, that's a lot of engagement, but it's also a lot of Sankofa in the sense that you're not just going to the past to stay in the past. You're going in the past to bring it forward and use those print. What does Umoja mean in 2022? What does Ujamaa Uj mean in 2022? What does uh, Imani mean on January 1st? Why is it January 1st? 20, the 26th of, of December through January 1st. That was very deliberate in a sense that it what it does is it disrupts the calendar in the sense that it's not going to be on the 25th and then end on the 30th and now New Year's Day. No, we're going to bring it over into January the 1st and do it the day after Christmas to occupy that space for practical reasons. A lot of people are off for ideological reasons. It's not Christmas. And to create a new rhythm in the calendar because January 1st, whether it be, we know that last night was watch night service uh, in, in the Christian traditions. That's a very, that's an African tradition and our ways of knowing that we created here. It was also a solidarity uh, moment that you saw January 1st, 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation went into effect. So people stayed up all night in the churches in Philly and New York and other places. They said, now, the Africans have been freed by the paper, and now we go get these guns and free ourselves. So you see them that are enjoying, because the paper don't mean nothing unless we stick it on the end of this bayonet and kill everything moving with Confederate States of America. January 6th coming up in a minute, so we'll maybe come back to that in a second, because it may just be a hot civil war, jump out of this cold one that's coming. But at any rate, but then you remember, I remember um, William C. Nell, William Cooper Nell, who uh, a, a writer, a scholar, who in 1863 said, now January 1st has a different meaning because before January 1st in the South was considered among many of the enslaved the worst day of the year because January 1st was the day in, in, on many plantations where those who had us captive would decide which of us would be sold or rented out. So you might have your family broken up on January the 1st. And William C. Nell in one of those northern churches, I want to say it was New York, said that finally, perhaps now, January 1st can lose the meaning that it has had before as we make this our Emancipation Day. So we talk about Juneteenth, but really Juneteenth is like uh, a child of January 1st. It's really about emancipation. They found out in some parts of Texas in June 1865, but January 1st, 1863 was the date. It just happened to be June because that's how the army was moving. But I said I'd to say this: Kwanzaa goes from the 26th of December to January 1st, very intentionally. That wasn't a mistake because then it bleeds into the next year, and the last principle is Imani. So I started to say this: those contributions are incredibly important. At the same time, Karinga did time. He was locked up for four years. He was convicted of, uh, among other things, uh, brutalizing, you know, torture. Brutal, brutal acts toward these women. And rather than get into a detailed conversation of that, because the trial record apparently has disappeared. And believe me, I've looked for it over the years. I've listened to people who are members of the organization, us. Uh, if you read my colleague Scott Brown's book, uh, Fighting for Us, New York University Press, you can get a nice kind of uh, description of the organization, which still exists. The African American Culture Center is still there in South L.A., uh, they do the annual Kwanzaa, Kwanzaa message. Uh, they do things year round. Um, the organization that Dr. Karinga heads, uh, chairs rather. And it's a, 
it's a difficult but necessary conversation because Dr. Karinga has maintained from then through this day that he did not engage in any of those activities and that he was set up, that he was a part of the counterintelligence program war that was going on. And scholars, um, including generations of scholars who have no ties to black community, I'm talking about black scholars now. I don't really think about social structure uh, scholars who have no connection to any of these things. Scholarship is not neutral. It is never neutral. And, um, you know, they they cast a blind eye or criticize and then continue to hold up murderers uh, and uh, indefensible anti-humans like uh, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, George Washington, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Killers of millions uh, like uh, Harry S. Truman. Uh, you know, I mean, so anyway, so I don't really get into a uh, 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 argument about competitive morality because that one is one that you will always lose, right. um, particularly when you will hide people who had drones that kill people who had nothing to do with battle like Barack, uh, Barack Hussein Obama. I mean, there's really no way to defend anybody. <laughs> so with Karinga, I was just, just going to make it real simple. Um, those of us who were raised with a King James Bible who are able to take those words uh, and live by them and ignore King James as a figure, uh, historical, uh, horrific, that we have the capacity to be able to practice Kwanzaa and not focus on Karenga, whether he did it or didn't. Exactly. Right? The principles Exactly. Matter. And again, I mean, again, it's tough though. It's tough for, it's certainly tough for me because I love John Henry Clark. John Henry Clark was like a grandfather to me. I spent a lot of time with him the last 10 years of his life. And I know Dr. Karinga, I know the, the, the shaping impact his thought and his thinking has had on the way I think um, very early on. And it's difficult because when you know these people and then you know a lot of people who were with them, who continue to be with them, you hear it different. As young people say, it hit different. So I know people who will not. Nah, why? I mean, they still fighting that fight. And I'm not saying they shouldn't fight that fight. But then we have to have a different conversation because that's different to me than somebody searching through an archive so they can become famous for writing a book or get tenure for writing a book. Mm -hmm. and, and then they sit and say, well, this is... Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, nah. Because now they've discovered the Black Power Movement. So all these books are coming out now from scholars, including a lot of these young Black scholars who are writing about things they have no connection to and then presenting them to these white university presses, white institutions uh, as evidence of their genius. And it just reminds me of that child who has no connection to community, but is, you know, has figured out a way to play the game so they can be the smart Negro. And I'm like, and if, and if that bristles, if you're bristling a little bit for hearing that, somebody who's listening to this and bristling, here's my advice to you, bristle. So at any rate, because I want all that smoke, every last bit. I, mean, I said I don't want none of it. Why? Because baby smoke and it's a distraction because I'm going to read your book anyway, because, you know, it may be something that you found in the archive that I didn't know about. And I'll go get that. But your interpretation, as I said many years ago, very nearly worthless because you're not part of a living tradition. Not that you couldn't be. And then I would just say, come on home. Stop trying so hard because there's still people locked up. And see, this is why I say it's difficult because. uh you know, there are still people who are doing time who are considered captive political prisoners. And there are many of them in the prisons of the United States of America who come from that moment because the social structure, the federal government, the U.S. version of what Bishop Tutu was talking about in his preface to Steve Biko, the book of Steve Biko saying that this black on black stuff that you're seeing, this was four minute from without. What happened in KwaZulu Natal leading up to the election in April 1994? Y'all did that. But then you bring the cameras in when black people are hitting one another or necklacing somebody and somebody on fire. So look at this black on black violence. As Amos Wilson wrote in his book, Black on Black Violence in Service of White Domination. The counterintelligence program was real. I was not there. I know people who were. I've heard just about every side of this that you can hear. So anybody listening to this and saying, okay, well, don't make him, if you ain't, if you ain't been quiet and absorbed that, if you ain't been in rooms, if you haven't been in spaces where it looked like with a split word this way or that way, the whole thing could turn into a fist fight, you can sew your mouth shut every time. You have nothing to say on this 
until you have sat with people who've been through. And it's a deeply personal thing. It's very complicated. So like you say, in the, in the court of King James, you know, if we were there, I think we'd have a different opinion. But here's what time does and the violence of forgetting. It covers up the crimes. Except at that moment when you see that debate between John Henry Clark and Cornell West in that moment, when Cornell brings up uh, Milana Karinga, John Henry Clark is not responding from a book or from a philosophy. That's a living thing in his mind. And that line that he drew is a line that some other people, you know, continue to draw. And I respect it, even as I respect the contribution that Dr. Karinga has made. And a lot of people who are in his organization, a lot of people who have promoted and extended Kwanzaa, who are deep, uh, deep friends and family with him. And I know a lot of those people, too, have a great deal of respect for them. I understand that in that complicated process, the thing that we always have to do, we're going to talk about our ways of knowing, is that we have to be as honest as we can be with each other. This is what Bishop Tutu was saying in terms of black consciousness. We have to have the courage to be critical without and corrective without just drawing these ideological lines. Because and the only thing I say is this on that specifically. It's difficult, but. I look at the people who got all the smoke for each other and no smoke for their oppressors. Exactly. No smoke for their oppressors. I'm saying, you know, and I, I used to, man, we used to joke about this because, you know, some of these meetings, you've been in them meetings that last all night. We in there arguing. I said, you know what's funny to me? We in here hacking each other to pieces. And if a white six-year-old walked in here right now, everybody be quiet as a church mouth. If you spit on one of y'all, you would just sit there and have to spit fall down your face. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because at the end of the day, until and this is the this is the wow. deep, you know, this is the deep work of Francis Cress. Well, that's why I love Francis Cress Wilson, Doctor Wilson, who was treated badly by black institutions, particularly Howard University, where she didn't get tenure. She had published her Cress Theory of Color Confrontation. I'm just reading the issue of the Black Scholar, rereading when she published it in the Black Scholar after she had published it separately. And she didn't get tenure at Howard. He's scared Negroes, scared, shaking in their boots. I understand though, because you know your master is real in your mind, but Doctor Wilson. We used to always talk about this. You know, when we are scared, we lose our capacity to be human. Because, mm -hmm. you know, this is why, regardless of, and, you know, and, and I'm saying this about Dr. Karina and, 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 and Dr. Clark and Dr. West and all this, but, you know, Bishop Tutu was not without his critics. Nelson Mandela, not without his critics, as we talked about last week. I think in the office hours, we talked about it most. But it's complicated now when it comes to Kwanzaa. Those principles did not come from us. Those principles didn't come by us. I mean, the organization us did not come from Milana Karinga. Those principles are drawn from many different ritual traditions across the continent of Africa. They are drawn, in fact, from the diversity of Africa. They are articulated in Kiswahili, as we talked about last week, and if we did not just mention it here, because Kiswahili is a trade language, it's East African, it is not connected to one ethnic group. It was precisely because Kiswahili is not a tribal language that it was chosen. In fact, the debates really came down to we could have a pan-African language out of the thousands of languages uh, around the continent of Africa, 20% of the world's land mass, all these different languages, all these different regions, every climactic environment in the world except the Arctic climactic environment is in Africa. So you've got the full human diversity and the oldest people in the world, which means the longest gene pools, which means what? The tallest, the shortest, the lightest, the darkest. Everybody is there. The, the keenest nose, the flattest nose, the largest lips, the thinnest lips. Everybody is there. All the geological diversity is there except those that migrated out and adapted to those environments. But the point is this. Can you have a pan-African language? Immediately they would say no, because it's too diverse. Hold on. Because another thing that struck me watching Bishop Tutu's funeral today is that everybody's speaking in English. Mm -hmm. And every once in a while they would come into Kasa, maybe say a word in Zulu. But how English become the damn mono language? Or, ironically, lingua franca. How is English a lingua franca and that term coming through the French is, is, is Latin? Why? Because what Europe did was make up a unity. The Irish are not Romans. The Germans are not Romans. So what you talking about lingua franca? Why? Because y'all decided we're going to be a we and you're going to be a other and we're going to impose our will on the globe. 
And so even those places that have an unbroken memory, like China, which is not just a country, but a civilization, when they get ready to do business, they got to learn English. Why? The English wasn't even holding no weight in antiquity. While the Greeks and the Romans were doing what they were doing, the English up there trying to figure out how to to hit two rocks together to keep warm. So how did English, because by the time it came their turn, they had the guns and the muscle. And now we all speak English. So when we start talking about the diversity and we can't all come together, let me ask you, I, I, this is another example. People say, we can't come together. Dr. Carr said, well, maybe you're right. Say that again. We can't come together. Well, what do you mean we can't come together? I'm saying we can't come together. I said, can I ask you a question? What, what language are we using to have this conversation about whether we can come together? <laughs> English. Okay. So are, are you from Great Britain? No, neither am I. Hmm. One more time, say it again. We can't come together. And then you start seeing where are we going with it. No, I'm asking you a question in a language that came from a tiny little set of islands <laughs> in the world. They didn't just have the gun and the muscle. What they, they had, what they have, Professor? They had the inhumanity. So oh, I'm sorry. You know, China what? had gunpowder, Africans had That's weapons, right. you know, but the, right. the ability to not care about humanity mm. gave them a superpower because you know even like i always talk about this awari game this awari older yes. than chess the the you have to win you have to leave your opponent with a seed you have to leave your opponent with a way out yes their superpower was no way out no way total out. decimation no total way destruction out. that's right no which, way out. which was unheard of and unseen before that's and that's I, exactly I, right so no no that's important because you're right, because then what happens is this is why education is so important. Education is about socialization as in addition to everything else. So when you say that, Professor Hunter, it had not been seen before. That is correct in terms of this global scale, of course. But then in 2022, we hear documentaries, public conversations school curriculum, classroom assignments that will begin with slavery is universal. It has existed since, hold on, hold on. Unfree labor arrangements, sure. But does slave mean the same thing here as it meant there? Well, I was reading something the other day where they were saying that um, uh, the main way that people got slaves was as a result of war. So that the United States, in fact, it was, <laughs> let me see if I have it over here. Yeah, this is a fascinating thing. This is the latest edition of a journal um, that is published out of Brooklyn called Catalyst. I've been subscribing to this since it first came out. James Oaks has an article. This is a, what we consider, quote unquote, left journal. I read all the stuff I can. He's got an interesting piece called What the 1619 Project Got Wrong, James Oaks. Oaks is a distinguished historian, very interesting guy. I mean, he, in fact, I got one of his, I got his most recent book over here. I don't know if I have it over here in this stack because I was reading it when it first came out. It's on Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, at any rate. Uh, an, an interesting piece, but I won't get too deep into that. Uh, what's the name of that book? Um, the Crooked Path to Abolition. Oaks, on Abraham Lincoln now. He's his criticism of the 1619 project. I won't get into deep. I mean, we talk about this on office hours, maybe we won't. But one of the things Oaks is talking about is that the 1619 project asserts that what it proposes is new, it's a new reading of American history. And I don't think that's completely fair to, to Jake Silverstein, Nicole Hannah Jones, and the people who put together the 1619 project because. That I think they over they do overstate that, but I don't think that's that's not all. They're not really saying that what they're saying hadn't been said before, but they are kind of trying to say it, and then they got feed pushback, and then they tried to soften it. But it, it's a little bit more layered than that. But what Oaks does is go basically chapter and verse through the ideological thrust of the project, and he's bringing up all these scholars who wrote about this before. And although it's interesting because in the first movement in a very long in a very long piece. This, this begins on page nine of this and it ends on page 50, 40 page piece where he deals with this. But he's, <laughs> he he notes all these white scholars, Kenneth Stamp, 
uh, Leon Litwack. He went to school at Berkeley, Cal Berkeley, for his graduate study. So he's talking about Leon Litwack. He's talking about uh, um, Kenneth Stamp. He's talking about the strange career of Jim Crow, C. Van Woodward, uh, who have been writing about this. And then in the footnote, you see that some of the places they're publishing there, 1619 is an important date. You got to go back before that, even the Spanish can. Some of the places they're publishing is in the Journal of Negro History. And I'm waiting for him to name Carter G. Woodson. He finally drops Lorenzo Johnson Green and some of them. And then he says that uh, the 1619 Project skips over and goes to the 19th century and recognizes George Washington Williams. And I'm like, he it's like he's doing calisthenics to avoid the fact that black people been talking about what's being talked about in the 1619 Project in terms of their, their intellectual spine. And I, I said this to uh, to Jake, to Silverstein, and to Nicole. You know, they've been we've been talking about this since we learned to read and write in English and Spanish, by the way. So in terms of enslavement, this is absolutely nothing new. But anyway, the reason I'm bringing it up now is not for any in-depth conversation about this because you can see the flaws even in, in Oaks's attempt. It's all ideological. It's, it's really ideological warfare, which is where I'm going with this. He drops this notion that the United States, when it, as it was becoming the United States, uh, the American Revolution wasn't about ending enslavement. And he makes a very powerful and compelling argument about the nature of the colonies in the sense that, yeah, in South Carolina, yeah, in Virginia, but Massachusetts, Rhode Island, other places, even as they had abolitionist sentiments and had some people who were racist, openly racist, you can't group all 13 of those colonies to having a lockstep mentality on the issue of enslavement. And in fact, there were many abolitionists. I mean, you know, the Quakers in Pennsylvania, regardless of whether we think about their ways of knowing and anti-African ways of knowing, we're not going to get into that. And, I, you know, that would be, I think I'm maybe, I, I don't know, I start to say reach out to James Oates, but I don't know about that. But anyway, the point is that in the course of him trying to disaggregate the 1619 Project argument about the nature of enslavement, he then asserts that, in fact, what you could say is that the United States is the leader in modern history for creating the abolition, the abolition of enslavement. So really what the American Revolution is, is anchored in is the assertion that everybody has equality and freedom, and that becomes the platform for the end of enslavement. So you should give the United States credit for ending. And I'm thinking to myself, this is a magnificent example of ideology at work. Because you start with the assertion that human beings are all the same everywhere on the issue of enslavement. And that really the United States leads by birthing something new in the world. And you never pause to ask yourself, what was the nature of unfree labor, particularly in conflict, that you now give the label slave in West Africa in the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th century, in ancient Egypt in the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th century BC. But you never do that. You flatten all the distinctions so that you can bring yourself into world history as the savior. And I don't have any problem. I tip my hat to you, but I tip my hat to you in the context of ways of knowing. You understand that number one, you ain't trying to work that hard. Number two, you ain't trying to work that hard to find out the distinction. And number one, the distinctions are not necessary for your project. What well, your project is the superiority of your culture. You can say no, but your evidence shows me that you have no interest in nuance, which tells me you think you're the best. And you don't even want to find out whether or not you're the best or not. So when we start talking about Kwanzaa, I think Karinga's project was and remains, I think, to give us some language for then us to then occupy ourselves to find out in dialogue with ourselves what is the best that we have created. What is the best, which is why that Kawaita philosophy, you go in the past, take that, and then you come into the present and apply that to your current situation and you use the best of what you have done. That doesn't belong to any individual. It belongs to all of us. And in, that, in the case of Clark and West having that debate, I am certain. And yeah, well, I was having my, I was having fun with with, with Cornell. I was a young cat at the time, <laughs> uh, and so you know, I was having fun. I said, "You say you're a New World African." In other words, you know, yeah, let, let's talk about that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And 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 Clark was having fun with. I'm sorry, West was having fun with Dr. Clark, in the sense that Dr. Clark he was basically trying to say that you, you know, you, you kind of were with us. And if you read uh, my sister, um, by, by us, I mean the leftists. And you know, Clark, Clark came to New York. He was born 1915, January 1st, 1915. He said he was late being born. Everybody was mad because of New Year's Day and they was waiting to eat. 
So <laughs> my people was mad at me in, in Alabama, Union Springs, Alabama, because I, I came late that day. Uh, Dr. Clark, who sat at the knee of who he called his deities, his great grandmother, who has seen the enslavement, Mom Mary, uh, his fifth grade teacher, Miss Everlina Taylor, his mother. I mean, you know, Clark, Clark worshiped black women you know and uh he worships black people but black women in particular particularly those three sisters and then uh clark but then he leaves and comes to new york before his 20th birthday he's like 18 years old so he shows up in new york in 1933 trying to go to the world's fair in chicago hobo on a train is a fascinating story john we talked about clark at length so i won't go into it now but he comes to new york in part looking for arturo schomberg the great african puerto rican scholar and bibliophile the book man i want to talk and remind me professor hunter i want to talk about a book man who made transition in the last uh, last month who i think we should lift his name very important he worked at the strand bookstore for many many years but you know when you're a book woman when you're a book man when you were of the book you know clark was looking for him in particular because they had told him in alabama he had no history he was a Sunday school teacher as a little kid. They called him a little fess, little professor, because he was a reader. He was a scholar, a young scholar. And they, and they, you know, in those segregated places in the South, I don't, let me stop using the language of social structure. In those black communities of the South, we invested, we, we believe education was something. We held up those who were educated, our children. That goes all the way back to the ancient Egyptians in terms of black communities. When you read the ancient Egyptian texts, the Sabaite, they say, when that young person comes, who is the scholar, who is the reader, who is the writer. You respect that child. You, you encourage that child because that child will be the one who carries forward the society, who has the memory. So you nurture that. So that I mean, we, don't, we don't look to the traditions of Europe. We don't look to Oxford and Cambridge. We don't look to Central European University, which goes back to the 14th century. We don't look to Harvard or Yale or Berkeley or University of Chicago. We don't look to you for our intellectual grounding. We, we were doing that when y'all were still trying to figure out how A relates to B and that relates to C. In fact, how to scribble something down while you were avoiding being eaten by another animal. We were somewhere sitting quietly, drinking our beautiful drink and having our children learn how to read and write. In fact, we invented the letters and numbers. So don't start. We don't look to you for that. So in Alabama, that same thrust in terms of ways of knowing that the Clark had that ways of knowing, thrust in him as a child. And then they told him in the social structure, we ain't had no history. And he, then they gave him a Bible where there were no black people that he knew at the time because he didn't know enough to be able to trans. He's a child. He's saying, where the, where the black angels? He says, ain't no black, ain't no, not one got in. And so he's, he's constantly questioning. And so when he was then in school, in uh, junior high school, a, a class speaker came and had a copy of the 1925 book by, edited by Elaine Locke called The New Negro. By then, Dr. Clark, 10 years old, he was 10 years old when the book was published. Now he's in junior high school a couple years later, and the brother had the book. And Dr. Clark, as one of the better students in class, was given the honor of holding this man's things while he prepared to come and give this talk. So he had his coat, had his books. He's looking, the new Negro. Let me look at this. And he looks in and he sees an article by Arturo Schomburg. Arturo Schomburg is called The Negro Digs Up His Past. And he says, that's when I saw we have a history. Y'all been lying to me. I knew we had a we 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 had we hit. So at he ends up in New York looking for uh for Schomburg and he spends time with Schomburg. He finds Schomburg at the 133 135th Street Library, the library that now bears his name, and that was expanded to take up that whole corner of the Schomburg Center um for research and history and black culture, research and black culture. Uh, down the street, he had stayed for a time. We talked about Anna Arnold Hedgeman a lot in here, Polly Murray in here, that YMCA on 135th Street in the street where Willie Mays played stickball in the streets on his days off from the New York Giants. And uh, Langston Hughes stayed in there. Uh, Willis Huggins, one of his teachers from Alabama, Willis Huggins from Selma, um, uh, they used to have a meeting of what they call the Old Harlem History Club, or the Edward Wilmot Blyden Society in the basement there. I've been in that theater, stood there in that theater, the little theater in the basement of the Harlem 135th Street. Uh, uh, why? But at any rate, Clark, as West is talking that day, evoking New York City, evoking these traditions, Clark was also in contact and conversation with the Garveyites, the UNIA, also very, pro very prominent in Harlem, very prominent in the country. The, the Black left at a time when you had state surveillance and state repression. By the black left, I mean Afflip Randolph and Chandler Owen, 
I mean, open socialists. I mean, those reading at that time, they may call them the Bolsheviks or whatever. The social, you have uh, people like Audley Moore out of Louisiana, Queen Mother Moore, Communist Party affiliated. You have, and then by the time you get to the 1940s and 50s, you're going to see everybody from Paul and Essie Robeson, WB and Shirley Graham Du Bois uh, in these configurations that are very either involved in or adjacent to the Communist Party, CLR James and them coming out of Caribbean. And so Clark writes in this book that, um, and we talked about this, uh, this is the piece that the sister put held up to her face, The Legacy of John Henry Clark, Book One, African Heritage Studies Association. This is the new edition, Shelby Lewis, Earl Clowney, and my dear friend, Afia Zakia. Uh, we were all in school together. We, we were kids together. Um, Dr. Clark said this because he gave his books he gave his papers to the Schomburg. If y'all want to research John Henry Clark, you got to go to Schomburg, look at his papers. And he gave his books to the Robert Woodruff Library, the Robert Woodruff Library at the uh, Atlanta University Center. And, and so what Dr. Lewis, Shelby Lewis, uh, printed in here, the ceremonial dedication of the John Henry Clark collection to the Robert Woodruff Library, Atlanta University Center. And when they took the books down, after the books made it down there, I used to go down there and sit with the brother who was cataloging the books, who was now an ancestor. But this is what Clark said, because this is why West, if you watch that debate, keeps making these overtures to Clark's socialism. I remember Corinthian them engaged with the socialists. There's this long tradition. There are people now on the black left who are now, because they're not part of genealogy, trying to write about it and listen about it. And they're very critical often of contemporary black nationalists. They say, well, you're not dealing with class. And, and I'm just laughing because, again, these aren't new debates. These aren't new discussions. And the social structure is against all of us. And as John Henry Clark said, you can make any ideology work for you. This is what he says. Clark says, he said, we had a system called taking in informal adoption within the community. I'm glad I came from a position of struggle in the community. I've been a socialist, a pan-Africanist and an African nationalist most of my life. I see no contradictions in being all three of them simultaneously. I've had over 50 years of direct relationship with the American Communist Party. I've been a severe critic of the party all those 50 years, not because I did not believe in what it was doing, but because its relationship to non-European people was all too narrow and they reflected a form of paternalism that was a new kind of racism on the left. They acted as though it wasn't significant to seriously study the societies in Africa and Asia before the interference by Europe. I think that it is important to seriously study religions and cultures of people and do not prescribe something by people who did not even exist when Africans were sitting on thrones of pure gold. I thought it was necessary to look back into their history and their worth. And I seriously at that time began to ask whether what we call Christianity and what we call communism were carbon copies of societies that existed before. I questioned whether the carbon copy was as honorable as the original. The carbon copy not only had dogma and formalization, I do not think communism failed. I think the communists failed. I do not think Christianity failed. I think the Christians failed. And I think every great world idea that Europeans projected on the rest of the world failed because they projected from an arrogant point of view as though it was something they invented. They did not investigate the same religions and the same cultural traits and the same social order that existed in other societies without dogma. Clark was always consistent on this. Don't get so caught up in your ideology that you become dogmatic. And I think like so many other things, we tend to take from different traditions as they can benefit the argument we're trying to make instead of listening to those traditions, listening to those elders, listening to those children, listening to each other and trying out of that to be animated by a sense of umoja, unity, by a sense of kujichagalia, self-determination, by a sense of ujima, cooperative economics, by a sense of ujima, collective work and responsibility, by a sense of kuumba, creativity, by a sense of Nia, purpose, and by a sense of Imani, faith. In other words, what is animating? What are we, what's our purpose for having this conversation? Do we have faith that we can see forward into this new space and do it together? If we're going to start a business, this ain't about making you rich. It's about how do we develop and co communicate so we can work together? How is it so that you can do what you do and I do what I do, but we do it together for community purposes so that we can all advance together? And then if we're saying this, let us speak our special truth to the world so that people can say, you know what? 
I ain't even from y'all. But what you said out of your specific tradition appeals to my common humanity with you. So I'm going to learn in this black consciousness movement that y'all talking about that I don't have to do it the way you do it. But what you said makes a lot of sense. Let me go back to look at the way I'm doing things. In fact, here's something that we do that you didn't know anything about. Let us now have a conversation. That's that self-determination. And we do it in the sense of unity, not uniformity. Not uniformity, because the bitter irony of this is that we're having this conversation in English. <laughs> and the French to this day turn their nose up at the English. The Germans turn up their nose at everybody. The Italians turn up their nose at everybody. And the Sicilians looking at the Italians like, y'all fake Sicilians. I mean, so we want to start talking about diversity. But then they form like Voltron when it comes time to take somebody's stuff. And here are the Africans saying, let us model them and come together. John Henry Clark is like, why are you talking about copying them? This is the problem. Yes. This is the problem. And so here we are on the first day of January. An invention, an arbitrary number on a name of a Roman God on a calendar divided up and jiggered with by other people that we no longer question. We just kind of go along asking ourselves, what can we do? to stave off what appears to be the next possible extinction of the species, the next possible fracture of our communities. And what can we do to pull back from that? And I guarantee you those, 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 those lessons are not to be derived exclusively from the debates of George Washington, from the debates of pain, and Hamilton and James Madison and the Federalist Papers, because, you know, and maybe we can pivot a little bit from now because I was thinking about this, particularly with what's going on in Chile now. You know, can you imagine, Professor Hunter, if we had the courage in the United States of America to say, let's just rewrite the Constitution. In fact, let's just write a new one. People do it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that would require uh, honesty, right? That that there that would require self self examination that this country has never been able to do to to engage in, right? It would require something of each of us individually to say something is fundamentally wrong. Let's fix it instead of what hmm. we've been doing, which hmm. is to just accept the lie, right? Hmm. Even, I mean, you just framed it. Today's January 1st. Why? Why? You know, and why are we celebrating? <laughs> you know, people are like, oh, y'all are going hard in the paint on a holiday. None of these none of these holidays have been holidays for me. You know, we, we are on miss, mission right now. And it's it's not about uh, taking time off. Yes, we all need self-care. We need to take time off. And we're, we're all going to do that. But I'm not moved by any arbitrary holidays that the, this, this country is, you know, forced foisted upon us so i don't know like it's <laughs> I'm, I'm engaged in the project that uh you they're trying to bring america together oh and, yes and I, you know and I, we talked about this off mic and on mic and you know i debated with myself do i want to participate in fixing this mm. it's like it's like that obelisk that that senyata was talking about that you've talked about here the obelisk that's broken and she was talking about it in Maroon's classroom, yes. uh, Maroon's medicine chest. And, you know, and you've, you've said this first, first place I heard it was from you, that the Egyptians stopped the project that maybe they were into several years, maybe even a decade, because there was a crack in the obelisk. And it I, wasn't I can't, I can't wait for us to go there and you to talk about this as you're standing on top of the unfinished obelisk in that swan of Hatshepsut. That when it cracked. What the hell are you going to do? You, you can cry or you can start again. I can't wait for you to have this conversation standing on top of that obelisk. <laughs> well, I mean, we're, we're living in a cracked obelisk. Yes. Every day. Ooh, and so I, go ahead. T tell us what, what your thoughts are. And please. No, tell no, no. Those, 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 those are bars. Those are bars. Let's sit with that in a minute. You said we. we mm. Oh, I should mention. The Washington Monument isn't an obelisk. We know that. I mean, there's a couple of books. There's one called Washington's Monument. There's another one called Obelisk, which is a history. Obelisk is a Greek word. The word that they, they would use in ancient Egyptian is Tekken. Tekken. A Tekken, what would be called an obelisk now, is carved out of a single piece of stone. That's why when you go to Eswan, the so-called unfinished obelisk, you can see this 
the outline is obelisk. You carve it out of a single piece of stone. If it cracks, you got to start again. Like if you hit and there's a natural fissure and it cracks, oh, we got to stop. We got to start again. No matter how far along you're in the process. The Washington Monument is stacked rock in the form of obelisk. But those are brick. I mean, they stack that. So it's not an obelisk technically. Um, and I should mention, by the way, you know, yes, it is January the 1st. And yes, we need moments of respite. And yes, um, the power of the pause is there. We've talked about that. And yes, we have to have different rhythms. That's why we have, quote unquote, New Year's resolutions. I want to do things differently. And yes, the last two years have disrupted everything and things some things are never coming back to the way they were because they should have never been in it that way in the first place um every day we're reading and hearing and living most importantly the experiences of people who say my commute was unsustainable my separation from my community and family and from myself was unsustainable whether it be students who are saying I can't face not being together to learn, but I also can't face the frenetic pace with which I ran from class to class to job. So I need now a different mix of the time I get to sit still and turn on a screen and talk and the time I get to go and be in community. So this has to be rethought because it was unsustainable. We're seeing people say, I will walk off this job before I do this again. We're seeing other people to say, I can't go back. I can't deliver another package. I can't go into another classroom full of six and seven year olds. I can't go, this is unsustainable. Teachers who are saying, you want me to teach this class in front of these people and also teach a class remotely at the same time, you've just tripled my workload, I quit. But what are you gonna do? I won't be here to do anything if I try to do that. I mean, so we know we're in a different territory and we know that for now 95 consecutive weeks, we've been in this conversation and that whether it be last Saturday, Christmas day, or this Saturday, New Year's Day, that this conversation that people might uh, look and say, well, when are you going to take time off? Well, here's the thing. The question for me is, what is time? Mm. How do we use time? We experience time, but we exist in time. Meaning that time is going to continue whether we exist or not in the present form. All of the people that we saw that made transition. And we open with Betty White. Betty White hasn't been an African in a long time since her ancestors walked out of Africa long before any of us were around. But she's a human being and she became a marker in some ways for in fact, it seems to me, thinking about John Henry Clark's distinction between religion and spirituality, Betty White damn near became a pop culture religion mm -hmm. in terms of becoming an icon. And what does that icon symbolize? In some ways, that icon symbolized this society's relationship to time. In other words, people attribute their fullness and richness of life with longevity. So Betty White making a hundred for some people became almost an article of faith. If she makes a hundred, I'll make a hundred. And so the outpouring of grief isn't just about someone doing what we all have done ever since there's been any human being, which is what made transition. It's about that number. Well, what is it about that number? Steve Biko was 30. What is it about that number? Bishop Tutu was 90. What is it about that number? Emmett Till was 14. What is it about that number? Jesus Christ was in the first third of a century. If indeed he lived, but it ain't, it ain't even important. Nobody asked what the age was Jesus Christ when he died. Unless you were seminary somewhere. The idea is, what are you using one life as a metaphor for? And so when people say, well, what if we weren't in this conversation right now, we'd be in another conversation, except perhaps we wouldn't be speaking as much. We would be listening. I would be listening to John Clark on the first of uh, first of January. I listen to the texts. When we get out of this conversation, I'm going to sit with the texts. I'm going to sit and listen. Why? 
because I know that at some point we're going to turn these screens back on again. And let's be very clear. When we were all those of us who have the luxury as a result of other people's labor to be still, when we were all still and unable to go anywhere and had the option, had the ability, in fact, had the directive to stay still and could honor that directive because we didn't have to leave then we know that these Saturdays became gathering places that some people used to stay sane. And that some people then download the podcast and went on their walks and listened to. And we're in, in company and in community to help people not be isolated. And for some people, particularly young people who were having a difficult time or not in that online learning, that screen time learning, this became a class. And so out of that was birthed a community narrative a community in Nubia, one that grows and grows as people recognize that as we come out of this moment, and we're not out of this moment, we both know that, we all know that, you've been talking about it nonstop and trying to caution people, I mean, Omicron is as bad as Delta variant? No, maybe, maybe not. But the point is, do you, do you want to risk getting it? Come on now. So, but even as we seem to be emerging there are things that we encountered over these last couple of years that we want to bring into 2022 because we have now made a different choice on how we spend our time. So that we spend our time saying, well, I'm in Nubia having this conversation this Saturday morning, or I'm on YouTube watching this later, or I'm now it's Thursday, or now it's Tuesday, or now it's the middle of the night, Monday night, and I couldn't sleep. So I press play and I'm learning something. I'm writing something down, or maybe I'm in office hours. And as we talked about before we, we, we hit, the, hit live, one of the things, 2020, you're saying, you know, we have books now in Nubia. We have books in narrative, rather, like the Miseducation of the Negro with a preface that we recorded our conversation. Well, you know, I was rereading some Woodson because we just passed his birthday. You know, we talked about those those four whose birthdays we just passed. Dr. Ben, Yosef Ben Yakinen, who birthday was uh, the 30th yesterday of December. Today, John Henry Clark. Uh, Chancellor James Williams, the 22nd uh, of, of, of December, and Sheikh Antajop, the 26th of December. And I'm sorry, yeah, 26th. No, no, I'm sorry, the 23rd. And in that conversation, I was thinking, you know, office hours, maybe for 30 minutes or so, first 30 minutes, maybe a little longer, we will devote to several chapters of a book so that everybody knows. So not the day after tomorrow, not Monday, but maybe the following Monday in office hours, we'll do the first three chapters of The Miseducation of the Negro. That way everybody has time to link in, to read, to think. And then we'll spend a half hour, 45 minutes so that people can now say, you know, as we get ready to launch these classes, these formal classes that we have in Judge and Everything States. You know, I always wanted to read The Miseducation of the Negro with somebody. Well, come read it with uh, 1,500, 2,000, 3,500, 10,000 of your friends <laughs> and get in the chat and start making comments and talk to one another and then talk and listen to us as we go back and forth. And what we're going to find is even if you've read The Miseducation of the Negro, you haven't read it the way you will read it when we're together. We create in study groups because everybody doesn't have time to study. But again, it comes back to this question. What is time? An investment of half an hour or 45 minutes with Carl G. Woodson takes him off your T-shirt and brings him into your living room. And now you're having a conversation because you got something to say to him, too. And out of that conversation, we build something different. We're under no illusions. We have the time. And I'll mention one other thing about time on a Saturday as we're talking about this on New Year's Day. We're not cleaning our houses and baking and cooking all the black eyed peas and wondering, you know, um, in fact, my friend uh, Kenyatta Ajinya in, in Georgia reminded me last week when we were talking about Christmas gift of that. I don't know if, if y'all had this tradition, Professor Hunter. I'm sure you did, but I don't know if it was it survived to, to our generation in the same way, although I know we heard about it. The first day Christmas Day or New Year's Day, there's a there's a there, there's a way of knowing that says you have to be very particular about the first person that crosses the threshold. Yeah, threshold. Yep, yep. So what did you? What was y'all's rule? I love these African ways of knowing people. I ain't no African, really. 
then what is this? <laughs> what, what was the what was the rule in your house? Something around the first man that comes through your door. Exactly. That's what Kenyatta reminded me. Mm. The first, you want a man coming. I'm thinking now, okay, is that a collision of Africa and the many diverse traditions of Africa as it relates to correct entry and exit? What Robert Ferris Thompson would say is, how do you enter and exit a space? That's there. Why is it a man? Is it a man because in a in a male white patriarchy, the house becomes a place that must be defended and maleness is associated in Western cultures, white maleness with protection. And then, of course, we pick up that bad habit as well, commingle with the things we were doing when we came from Africa. But for some reason, that was the rule. That's very interesting. Right. And this whole even this whole notion of cleaning up your whole house before January the 1st. Even the fact that as we go now and venture out and we had to go to the grocery store or go somewhere and you just can't leave, you can't avoid leaving. And you go through neighborhoods or go past the apartment complex, you look up and see Christmas trees today. Black people start flinching. You ain't supposed to have your Christmas tree up <laughs> January the 1st. You see all them Christmas trees on the dump. Why? We're going into this new cycle. Again, Kwanzaa is a bridge between the years. Why? Because the, the reminder is that, as you keep telling us, these seven principles are universal and they are year round. So January the 2nd is all seven principles. January 3rd is all seven principles. January 4th is all seven principles. Juneteenth is all seven principles. Every is all seven all the time. We only use this week to emphasize one and one and one and one and one and one and one so that we can remember to get that momentum. So in terms of um in terms of what happened in this last year of transition with Bob Moses and Vernon Jordan with uh you know Gloria Richardson and Cicely Tyson with all the ancestors that came time becomes something that is very difficult to gauge in the moment. What do I mean by that? Let's just think about this for a second. Because we talk about like what would be the most important stories of the previous year. And in the United States of America, it might be. In fact, I think it probably is January the 6th. So as you 2021, and of course, I never forget as you were live and then he, you had all, you were convening all these conversations in real time while they tearing up the country. And one of the conversations you convened was pulling me in, mm -hmm. and I forgot we was on screen, so I'm just pacing <laughs> back and forth Walking around. I was like, "Where is he going? Where is he going?" I mean, because that's normally what I would do. I mean, I almost <laughs> had to chain myself to, to the chair here because normally I'll be pacing if I'm talking. I'm thinking about something. I well, let me go pull this book, or let me. Go. So I'll be pacing. But in the years since. The country has been on trial and the federal government has been on trial. And so far, they they are moving toward a, a guilty verdict, guilty of not being able to do something different. God bless uh, Congressman Thompson, Benny Thompson out of Mississippi, the chair of the January 6th commission. But brother Benny, yeah, you filed a lawsuit against Trump and them. You will see where that goes. But let's be clear, man. You tell you you tell these people to testify, and they telling you like this is a white man's country. They straight quoting Andrew Johnson. I ain't coming to you for shit. I'm not gonna testify. Jail me. You got a whole ass sergeant of arms in the United States House of Representatives. These people should be locked up. Lock her up. No, that's that's theoretical. That's some old bullshit. You trying to win an election? Jim Jordan. You, Madison Carthen, all you cats. Uh, what's this? What's this crazy broad with the? Uh, and I say broad in in, in all uh, contempt. Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, I mean, I only say that because I'm going to use the social structure language. I mean, those of you who have a certain age know when you say it. I mean, and in fact, that's that's probably giving her more humanity. I was going to say broad is too kind. The broad is too kind. That's the kind of governance structure. And again, this is a very delicate conversation because we know in these conversations, plus their children. Watching you, I mean, I think about the we the attempts we've made to to repurpose pejoratives 
the other B word, for example, the N word. So I'm saying it in an endearing manner. And then, you know, people say, well, you don't call nobody a B word. Who you calling up? You and I, T, Y. Right. Well, I ain't never going to use the B word, even as I pass by a contingent of sisters using it freely, almost like people try to rehabilitate the N word. So, yeah, let me let me pull back from raw because that would almost be endearing in some context. So, uh, yeah, this um, this feared and hatred driven uh, person. And I'll even person maybe chair, but that's all right though. I'm gonna be like Tutu. I'm gonna channel I entered uh, Desmond Tutu this morning. But y'all should go to jail, but you're not going to jail. Why? Because Congressman Thompson and too many Congress people think there's a country. There is no country. You've been elected. What's on trial is the quote unquote rule of law. There's a book that's coming out next week. I've been reading the reviews, I've been reading the interviews. And I really can't wait to get my hands on this book. I wish if I if I had been able to get my hands on it before now, we'd be talking about it now. But I'm mentioning the title. Uh, it's called uh, The Next Civil War. It's by a Canadian named Stephen Marche, M-A-R-C-H-E. He's written a piece of speculative nonfiction, so to speak, because his argument is it's going to be a civil war in this country. And he says his 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 in a couple of interviews, he's saying people are saying, well, what do you mean it's going to be a civil war in the United States? You and Canada looking, he said, yeah, let me tell you, this country has almost broken apart several times during my lifetime. And you know, the history of Canada, you know about Quebec province. You know, Canada is basically France versus the United States. And every so often they have a secessionist fight. Montreal, Quebec province. I mean, it's, it's very serious. I mean, if y'all look at that, but he's looking and he spent a lot of time in the United States. He's he's written a number of other books straight you know, nonfiction, but he writes this one because he says, y'all can't hear it from the historians or the scholars. So maybe if I tell y'all a story, this base, he interviewed like over 200 people, military folks, politicians, uh, community leaders, activists, all over the full range of people. And his assertion is it's probably going to fracture. Now he's saying what we've been saying all along, certainly during this period of, uh, when we've had this in class and then with narrative, and this ain't, this ain't ringing an alarm bell. This is us getting ready for the inevitable. This country, for example, I mean, you know, this, you could read the Civil War like this. The Civil War in the United States was basically a truce where the North and business interests, and in order for the South and their interests not to leave the country that they never really wanted to be a part of unless it was on their terms, they basically gave them home rule for another hundred years. <laughs> in other words, y'all do what y'all want. Just don't leave. That's basically what it was. Well, they ended slavery. They did. And then they turned around and said, but y'all could do that apartheid thing and you just don't leave. Right. And then we had to end that in the 60s. Black people and whoever else of goodwill we could gin up to, to, to help as we engage in this struggle. And then there's been a long fight against it. And January 6th, that wasn't just 2021. Remember Donald Trump's inauguration speech, American Carnage, written by Steve Bannon, because Bannon is looking at the world. He's not looking at the United States. Bannon's hands, I am sure, are in part of the rationale that the Russian Supreme Court used last week to ban the oldest civil rights organization in Russia because they wanted to talk about the gulag and the Stalin years. And the, and the court said, no, nah, y'all are banned. Damn, look at this. Stop. Uh, Bannon has been in Brazil, in Latin America with Balanzero. And this right wing anti human stuff in France, where you see the possibility that a guy who ain't no champion of diversity in that sense, Macron, could lose the next election. Brexit. You see, but these guys, it's part of a global idea that we are pushing to save our version of civilization. So what Marche is writing about, he says, you know, when you hear American carnage in January 2017, and then shortly thereafter, you see tanks on the streets of Washington, D.C. on the 4th of July, and then they shooting tear gas at protesters who are out there saying, stop killing people, and they shoot tear gas at them, and then this this Klansman walks across the street from the White House and holds a Bible upside down. John Clark said, don't forget, religion without spirituality, that's a cult. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? He, and I'm, he didn't hold the Bible upside down. He held it right side up. 
Mm. That's a prop. <laughs> you understand? They don't read. Uh, uh, you never forget what Khalid Muhammad used to say. He said, people just say, why are you talking like that? I just go by my Bible. And Khalid would say, yep, you go right by your Bible <laughs> on the way to whatever else you was going to do. You never open it because believe me, it's a love murder in the Bible to keep you occupied. <laughs> but even if you look past that to the principles, because John Clark also said that many of these religions are male chauvinist murder cults. But you can make any system work for you if you're infusing it with a spirituality and a concern for each other. Some people say you can't make capitalism work. I would agree with them. You can't make capitalism work. However, if you are dealing with people's common humanity and spirituality, you're going to go past capitalism, which is basically what I think is about to happen. What possibly, I don't know that it will take place in Latin America as we, we, we turn the minute to what's going on down there. But uh, Marche is saying that it's going to be a civil war. And he said, well, why are you saying that? He said, take for example, he said, you see how y'all celebrating this uh, passing the bill back better bill, a huge achievement. He said in most mature democracies, that's a Wednesday. It's called a budget. But the point is that no one is under the impression that legislators will ever come to a political decision about abortion. It's totally beyond them. They've left it to the courts. And they have turned taking care of people and using resources for people. They have turned that into a political battle. What do you mean? Are we going to take care of people? I don't know. Is it? Here's the Financial Times from Wednesday. This is the front. Now, here is uh, Nontombi Tutu. Nontombi Naomi Tutu, Bishop Tutu's uh, daughter. This is the one where they excommunicated her from the church because she is in a same-sex partnership or uh, marriage. And Tutu was like, nah, but he stayed in the church. In fact, we've all heard that, well, many people have. If you haven't, you're about to hear it now. The old joke, so to speak, to say, you know, white people came to Africa and told black people, and black people had the land and the white man had the Bible. Then they told black people to get on their knees and pray. And when the black people got up off their knees and opened their eyes, they had the Bible and the white man had the land. <laughs> and so Tutu would tell that joke. Bishop Tutu would tell that. But then he would say, but I'm not sure that the Bible was a bad thing to get. That's when I probably would turn Bishop Tutu down because I had no commitment to any. Although in the principle of Ubuntu, of peoplehood, of familyhood, of nationhood, of peoplehood, he would try to infuse that Christian message with peoplehood, which then says, OK, as John Clark would say, well, maybe it wasn't Christianity that failed, it was the Christians. Yeah, okay, well, that we could we could have that conversation. But here's his daughter who they put out the church, and he didn't leave. But beneath it, here's the headline: corporate cash haul hits 12.1 trillion in blockbuster year for markets. During these last two years, as we see, companies raised a, re a record 12.1 trillion in 2021 by selling stock, issuing debt and inking new loans as central banks stimulus and recovery from the pandemic propelled many global markets higher. The legislation that passed put a lot of money in the coffers of corporations and they are hitting record numbers now as people are losing their capacity to be indoors, to eat today. So what's New Year's Day? You should take a break. Do people take a break from eating? There are people today who don't have anything to eat in the United States of America who don't have any place to stay. I go to the grocery store. There's a young brother. I see the grocery store going there maybe every couple of weeks. And the brother is was standing at shelter. And he's just so happy to have a job. Sitting there talking with the brother, listening to the brother in the morning. And then went in there last week. My man was like, they got me on the list. I'm interviewing for an apartment. He was so happy because he working now. He got his job. And sorry, bro. The city council of D.C. has a lot to answer for in terms of better legislation to help brothers and sisters like that. And they have a lot to be proud of because you got fighters on there. My man, Treon White, in Marion Barry's old district, War 8 Southeast of D.C., uh, Kenya McDuffie, I think about some of the people who I know in D.C. City Council, good brothers and sisters who are really trying to fight and their staffs, you know, but there are programs in D.C. that I'm sure the developers would like to get rid of right now that they are fighting to maintain because this man, when I go in there next week, check on him, I hope he gets this place. You know, when you got to, you, you work in long shifts at the grocery store and then you got to go up in the shelter and worry about somebody taking your stuff. 
If I, if I was a billionaire, he had a place to stay. We'd have play. And then you ask yourself, but these they are billionaires. They don't give a damn. They trying to figure out how to become trillionaires. And trillionaires have, trying to figure out how to lead the earth. <laughs> In other words, they, they, I don't know if you've seen this uh, new movie, uh, Don't Look Up. Have you looked at it? I have. What it's did a, you think about it's, it? I, I enjoyed the hell out of it. I did too. Word. For real. If y'all haven't seen it. We say something about that. Um, so Leonardo DiCaprio, who's been forefront, you know, with this climate uh control, Meryl Indeed. Streep plays the president of the United States. Uh Chef's Kiss. No question. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 uh they're scientists, you know, scientists who discovered that a comet is literally scientifically, mathematically heading towards Earth. A a comet the size, I think, of um Mount Everest or something like yeah, that. Yeah. Huge, huge, and it will destroy the Earth. Extinction level event, no question. And uh, the "Don't Look Up" is the title because somehow they got people to fight about this thing that mathematically the world has agreed is coming to hit this planet, <laughs> and then they let a one of them trillionaires who has an exit strategy figure out how to monetize because this comet has all of these written, you know wealth and riches <laughs> so they're gonna, you're gonna figure out how to i mean it's but it, you're laughing but it's exactly where we are right now that and that was the genius of it wasn't it you use this scenario to basically this is what this this is what this guy is doing in this novel right no comet is hitting the earth and then they like you said they figure out a way to seed and foment ignorance for profit but wait a minute let me just get this straight this thing is gonna hit us yeah 100 percent Jonah Hill, right, sitting yeah. in, the, in the Oval Office. 100%? Well, I mean, they're scientists. It will matter. I mean, 99.97%. Oh, okay, then. So it's not 100%. Immediately, <laughs> they start trying to spin it. And like you said, here come the Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos character. Yes, well, there are... Uh... They're precious minerals. And this ain't to give it away. Y'all should look at it because really, as, as you say, Professor Hunter, and this is the genius. And again, those conceptual categories apply to all humans. We just use them for African people because we have to fight our way back into humanity, as Dr. Clark would say. This is a form of commentary. It's a way of knowing. It's, and what you see is these Western ways of knowing. At the price and cost of my literal physical life, I'm still going to try to grab this profit. But you won't even be here to enjoy the profit. Well, I'm still going to try to grab this. If enough people organize against you, mm -mm. we're going we're gonna to start a program called uh, anti-masking or anti-vaxxing or CRT. CRT. It's called Don't Look Up. You can see the damn comment. Don't look up. Go to the rally. Make America great again. Don't look up. Are y'all really going to have Professor Hunter? My dear friend, Karen, Karen, I, and I'm sure, see, you talk to a whole lot more people than I do because you're talking publicly to everybody. Again, I mean, the stories. I mean, I have former students, friends who are doctors who have seen some of the most starkly terrifying things, who have experienced, who've been cursed out, who have, you know, admitting children who clearly have COVID, but the, the parents won't let them be tested because they don't believe in COVID. People who are saying, well, I didn't get the vaccine, but I feel like I should be able to walk in here with nothing on and talk to you, and I don't give a damn. They, well, then that's not about you. It's about me. There's no Ubuntu. There's no, there's no I mean, and, and when you hear those stories, and I know you've heard many more than I have, when you hear those stories, it just makes you want to re weep and rage and you ask yourself is there a future so this 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 what this movie does a good job of is reminding us that there is no future without us all coming to some consensus which means there might not be no future <laughs> uh i'm waiting for jesus to come back Look, I'm or a whole lot of others that's so, been uh what are we talking this, about it's gotta be that. 100 years anyway wait, wait. You know, but that that lack of humanity that is their superpower, our superpower is the opposite, is love and humanity. And yes. uh, when we remember that and double down on it because we are so in, indoctrinated and infected with their inhumanity, that it's, it's not natural to us. 
No. You know, it's not natural to us to 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 not care about one another, to 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 be selfish, to to put our own needs ahead of the entire world. You yes. know, and I was like, how do we get here to the point where we can't even trust the CDC? You know, like the CDC, I'm like, so you just y'all just on it? like what? <laughs> now that was a flex. Talk about a chef's kiss. Delta writes a letter and they cut the time in half. And then Delta puts the letter out like, y'all can't stop us. That's crazy. I don't know about you. Oh, man. We went to grad school with, I had a very good friend, Bridget Robertson, who put herself through graduate school, several degrees, including a law degree, as a flight attendant for Delta. And I mean, it's years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago. And because she retired now from that position, that that work, because she was working with a means to an end. I can't imagine being on one of them tubes with crazy people. I can't even imagine. I mean, back in the day, she used to tell us stories. We're like, what? I couldn't even imagine. Nah. I couldn't. I mean, <laughs> are you serious right now? People literally coming to blows. I'm saying, but we're in a metal tube. It don't even matter at this point whether your mask is on or off. You could put you, we could put duct tape, we could put you in a, a, a whole mask with a, it, with an oxygen. Whatever was in you, we done all breathed it now. It don't even matter. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We, we 30 minutes into a two hour flight, it's over. And every time somebody, when I went home, I mean, you pulling out your mask to eat some peanuts and I'm thinking, well, everybody say, don't put your, take your mask, keep your mask on except if you're eating. Well, she, so did COVID say, okay, they're eating. Let's just wait. <laughs> <laughs> How about no meal service? I mean, I, I, I mean it's like, what the hell? Well, the, <laughs> the, the lack of just common sense, you ain't got to have an IQ over 130. Like this, the lack of common sense among people who are supposed to, you know, the Tyler Perry character. <laughs> yes. Which I thought was appropriately played by Tyler Perry. Mm-hmm. Oh, Tyler Perry now, whatever we can say or not say, the reason Tyler Perry is popular, he has struck a resonant chord in ways of knowing. You got to you got to give him the palm on that. <laughs> no question. <laughs> I mean, but, you know, this is even media. You know, I'm like, really? This, all right, good news only? Or we just going to spin it however? You know, like, they just came on your airwaves and told you we're all going to die. Right. So, and then you say, well, is The Rock going to hit my wife's house, my ex-wife's house? <laughs> Why are you trying to make a joke of this? But I, love, I don't know if you saw some of the some of the criticism I read, the Times article, somebody else I read, they were saying that those two characters, what was the woman's, uh, Kate Blanchett? Uh, Kate Blanchett, yeah. Yeah, Kate yeah. Blanchett and Tyler Perry, who play these television anchors, that was a riff on Morning Joe. I can see that. Me too. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I haven't watched Morning Joe in so long that if I watched it now, it would almost be like, you know, how you give up something that you haven't eaten for a while. Then you eat it and get sick. Right. If I watch Morning Joe now, it'd probably make me sick because yeah. I would probably say, why can I watch this every morning? Because when I'm watching Joe Scarborough from Alabama, uh, from, from Florida, who went to uh, Alabama Road Tide and he's talking about how in this country, uh, Reverend Al, could you help? And then my man, my man, my brother, my dear brother, Eddie Blau, sitting there trying to keep his lips moist because he know he's going to cut somebody out. Eddie's sitting there. <laughs> well, uh, as Thoreau would say, right, we're dealing with this culture, right, where we're trying to, and I'm like, Eddie, just hold on, brother, hold on. I know the check is good. I know you're trying to get a message through, but you sitting next to a clan adjacent cat. And Mika's sitting there like, hmm, and I'm worried. As if your father wasn't at the table for every criminal enterprise on a global level that involved American national security over the last half century. <laughs> I'm sitting there like, but I understand. You think that if you're in this game, you can somehow change it, but you keep forgetting you can't win. You can't break even. You can't get out of that game. And I know MSNBC. I know CNN. I know that's important. And I'm not saying it's not. I'm just glad that we have this space where we can say what you would say if you didn't have to try to worry about how to translate for the social structure that's rotten. Even as others, like this Canadian Marche, in fact, he, there was an interview Marche gave where they, uh, the interviewer asked him about, I think it was in Washingtonian Magazine, this late newest issue. Um, um, I went down to my Central American people who have a magazine shop here and picked up the latest Washingtonian. And uh, they're asking about 
how so many different people in the United States of America could claim to all be wanting the same thing and based it on the Constitution. And Marche says, yeah, well, the U.S. Constitution is a document of great genius. And I would agree with that. But it's also a flawed 18th century document that should probably be discarded and rewritten. But anyway, document of great genius, as far as it goes. He says uh, it was the greatest political document of the century. OK, now, now we're going into the hyperbole. In fact, I would encourage people, if you've never seen Chancellor Williams' book, The Destruction of Black Civilization, get his book, The Destruction of Black Civilization, and go to the uh, chapter six, The African Constitution, The Birth of Democracy. Chancellor Williams wrote this book in the early 1970s, and he is not the first. This is 1974 edition. Um, reading a book right now by this Ethiopian cat, and I showed you all this book before, Theory of African Constitutionalism. In fact, we got a little study group that we're, we're reading and having this conversation about this question of African constitutionalism. And in chapter two of that book, the author, uh, Berahun uh, Gebeye, quotes extensively from the destruction of black civilization. And I thought to myself, damn, that's a hell of a thing to get past off the university press. My point is that when you say the U.S. Constitution is the greatest political document of the century, you're showing what you haven't read. But at any rate, Jefferson, he, he goes on to talk about how Thomas Jefferson said you got to rewrite the Constitution every 20 years or so, 19, 20 years. Thomas Jefferson said that. Now, Tom Jefferson on $2 bills. He's on T-shirts. People talk about Tom Jefferson, Tom Jefferson. They won't fight about Tom Jefferson and Sally Hemings. I don't fight about the master of the mountain to quote Henry Wiesnick's book. I'd have been trying to kill him, at least spitting his food or something. If I was trapped at Monticello, as I told you know my 10-year-old nephew when we went down there, this is a crime scene. But you know, if y'all want to cape for him, fine. But if you're going to cape for him, cape for him. Just like you don't read the Bible, you don't read Jefferson. Jefferson every 19, 20 years you need to rewrite the Constitution. And what Marche said is, as he wrote this book of speculative nonfiction, he said he talked to over 200 people. He said he talked to Texas separatists, California separatists, far right, far right oath, oath keepers, neo-Nazis, Black Lives Matter activists. He said they all worship the U.S. Constitution. And he said they all explicitly called to the Constitution for the justification of their politics. And he said, this is what would kill me when Marche said this. That's why I can't wait to read his book. He said, when you worship a dead document, you can't have a living government. Not when you, not when you don't access it, but when you worship it. People worship that Constitution. They never read it. I promise you, I keep a copy here because, you know, I keep this copy because, again, you know, school starts next week, the law school. We, we back up into action next week. And I keep copies of the Constitution. Now, of course, we're going to be virtual for the first couple of weeks because Omicron is real and Howard is like a lot of universities backing up. Again, we are in uncharted territory because one of the things that has been terribly convenient for me and for all my students in the class I teach is that when I'm referring to a document or a book that's not in storage, I can just grab it. I can't take all this to the law school campus. So we're in uncharted territory and I have to figure out and I have been figuring out how we're going to balance that because at the end of the day, it isn't about being in person or being online. It's about education. And if that is what we're promoting, if that's what we're committed to, we've got to be much more effective in how we do that. But anyway, I just said that to say that this is something I will I always stick in my briefcase. Uh, pocket Guide or Backpack, Pocket Guide to the Constitution. People haven't read this document. Just read the Constitution. It's very important. I mean, I keep several copies. In fact, just to make the point that you don't even need one that anyway, I won't you know, go because I keep several of them and then the compendiums. But what he's saying is that um, people worship the document, but they're not really looking at it, which is why I wanted to turn for a second to what's going on. Let me see. I thought I had. Oh, man. Oh, here we go. I have it here. This is from Wednesday's paper, Chile. We were talking about Chile. In Chile, they are rewriting their constitution. This was the uh, this is the front page. And somebody in, thank you, Nubians, uh, somebody posted the link because they didn't have a paywall to this article here written by uh, Samini uh, Sengupta in Wednesday's New York Times. Chile is rewriting constitution to battle ecological emergency. It's a very important, what, what's going on in Chile right now is very important. They, uh, in October, 2020, they had a national referendum 
uh, about uh, half the people in Chile voted who were eligible to vote. Chile is a nation of about uh, a country of about 19 million people. Uh, at, at, at least 15, 10 to 15 percent are indigenous people. There is a small Afro uh, community from enslavement. Chile is not one of the places where you see a large Afro community, but there is an Afro descendant community there and a, and a tradition as well. They voted almost 80 percent of them voted, said we need a new constitution. Because remember, we spent a whole lot of time around September 11th talking about September 11th, 1973, the United States coup, four minute coup against the elected government of Salvador Allende and the uh, installation of Augusto Pinochet, a right wing terrorist who ruled over that country. Uh, and in 1980, they wrote a constitution that was very favorable to business and all this kind of thing. Um, but in October 2020, they voted to have a constitutional convention and a referendum, and they said they would do that. So they elected a, a 155 representatives from across Chilean culture, across Chilean society, to rewrite their constitution. In fact, the first paragraph in uh, Sengupta's article says, uh, from Salazar, I'm sorry, from uh, Salar de Acamana, Chile. Rarely does a country get a chance to lay out its ideals as a nation and write a new constitution for itself. Almost never does the climate and ecological crisis play a central role. That is until now. In Chile, where national reinvention is underway, after months of protests over social and environmental grievances, 155 Chileans have been elected to write a new constitution amid what they have declared a climate and ecological emergency. Their work will not only shape how this country of 19 million is governed, it will also determine the future of a soft, lustrous metal, lithium, lurking in the salt waters beneath its vast ethereal desert beside the Andes Mountains. So if you know anything about it, there's a lot of coverage of that and there's been a lot of writing on that in terms of environment. But the reason I bring this up is because of those 155, they've had right-wing governments. Center-right, center-left is what they would write in the uh, papers and cover, but they were they were controlled by a fascist that the United States propped up, Pinochet, and helped when we talked about that Nixon and the intervention in Kissinger, who's still alive. But at any rate, some, some people evil is like formaldehyde, just preserves them. But he got, he'll go at some point. But the other 155 people, the right wing, only was able to secure 37 seats. So they don't have no veto power on this constitution. Meanwhile, you've got uh, student movements. Uh, you've got the socialist got 17 seats. You've got this broad student front that had 28 seats. The People's List is another group that was involved in the protest. They were in the streets in 2019. Massive protest. They got 26 seats. Uh, the indigenous, there were 17 seats set aside for indigenous uh, organizations representing indigenous people. The Mapuche people are about 80% of the indigenous people in Chile are Mapuche. They have seats in that 17. And it's interesting because they just elected in November uh, Gabriel Boric. And he's 34 years old. He was one of the leaders when he was in school of the student protest movement. And he is now the president of Chile. So what, what do you see happening? Here's where the social structure comes in. People say, oh, well, you know, y'all are all very diverse. And it's not, it's, Africa is a, um, it's not a country. Mm -hmm. Like John Henry Clark said, there are many ways to get to where you want to go. He says, we don't need, maybe the United States of Africa isn't a good idea because maybe you're patterning that on these failed European structures. And if I can anticipate what, uh, this guy Marche is going to write, he might think the same thing in terms of feder federation. But what Dr. Clark said many times was maybe you have regional Pan-Africanism and then you put together, based on regional Pan-Africanism, regional formations, you put together a larger Pan-Africanism and you invite the Africans of the diaspora into the conversation. Well, they certainly were starting down that path. When you look at the Organization of African Unity, the African Union, these are failed models in some ways, but rhetorically you see the foundations for there. ECOWAS, the West African states, SADC, the South African, the Southern African Economic Community, trying to put it together, even as these external people are trying to force African governments into a certain posture so they can continue to extract wealth. But even culturally, I mean, Karenga was not alone in this. Baraka, Haki Mabuti, uh, I'm thinking about people who are still alive, uh, but obviously, uh, Baba Miri is an ancestor, but Haki's still around, like Karenga. And when they went to the uh, the Sixth Pan-African Congress in uh, Tanzania. Of course, Greg Tate's mother 
who we talked about a couple of weeks ago, you know, there. And when there is six pack, they're grappling with how do we come together as Pan-Africans? And a lot of those Africans were from the diaspora. And so when they came, that's why they said, well, we can have languages that, that unify us, even as we continue with our own languages. Let's get a few regional languages, which is why they say, well, Kiswahili in the East. And what's the equivalent of Kiswahili in the East and the West? The West may be Hausa. So maybe Kiswahili and Hausa. And then the idea John Clark would say, you should teach your children to speak at least one African language. And that's why you see Kiswahili. If there's one African language that's taught at HBCUs in language programs, it's Kiswahili. The reason for that was the black student movement in the 60s and 70s. Because if you can speak Kiswahili, you can go throughout East Africa. If you can speak Hausa, you can go anywhere in Nigeria and spill over into Togo and Benin and some other place because it was a trade language. In other words, you're not going to anchor it in any particular ethnic group, more so for Kiswahili than Hausa. But the point is that in Chile, they're going to try to build a nation and write a constitution from the ground up. And who's going to push back? Here's something from the first page. It says what? Let me see if I can find it. No, no. Hold on. Let me go to page A9 because you see what happened. This is how you know it's on the radar of those who want to continue to rule the world when it gets a whole page in the New York Times. They go to bed, the lithium beds in the desert. In other words, y'all better start paying attention. We're about to have a revolution. We got a damn people's revolution. This is what it says. Let me see here. Uh, ah, Watch this. On, not November, December. On December 19th came another turning point. Voters elected Gabrielle Boric, not 34, 35 a 35-year-old former student activist as president. He had campaigned to expand the social safety net, increase the mining royalties and taxes, and create a national lithium company. I won't read into the details of what happened, but when Pinochet took up, took over, they, they then privatized the lithium company because see, Pinochet and them was going in the direction of socialism. We're going to make the resources of this country work for everybody in the country. Well, she, he was like, hell no. They and then he gave his son-in-law control of the company. His son-in-law still alive, still owns 30% stake in the privatized lithium company. And if you read The Economist, if you read The Wall Street Journal or The Financial Times, they will say Chile is an example of Latin American success. What does that mean? They built their whole economy on export. Oh, so in other words, your companies, the ones that made like $12.1 trillion last year during the whole ass pandemic when other people lost their jobs and didn't have nothing, they like Chile because Chile basically is a license to steal. Yeah. Okay. Well, what are they gonna do? You got you got people's a people's assembly getting ready to write a constitution from scratch. Then an elected a president who was one of them people in the protest, who is now the president. What y'all gonna do? They're gonna form like Voltron. There is no diversity. From the New York Times on Wednesday, it says the morning after his victory. The stock price of the country's biggest lithium producer. Uh Sociedad Quimica y Minera de Chile, or SQM, fell 15%. Mm. One-fifth of the world's lithium is produced by SQM, most of it in the Atamaca Desert in northern Chile in the shadows of ancient volcanoes. It goes on to talk about this. But point is this. The business people are the fail-safe. Hold on. Socialists? Let's, let's destroy their economy. Crater the prices. Don't trade with them. This is what they did in Haiti. After the revolution, created a problem. This is what they would do with Grenada. This is what they would do in Guatemala. This is what they do in El Salvador. This is what they do in any, any, hell, this is what they do in the United States and black communities that try to take economic control. If And if they, and if all else fails, shit, just fly a plane and bomb it, Tulsa. In other words, these people, they're not interested in Ubuntu. These are open. And then we talk about diversity. Only time they talk about diversity is when it's in their interest. Because when it's in their common interest, they move in their common interest. When it's in our common interest, they call that socialism, communism. That's the don't look up people. But the people who really have something to lose, the Elon Musks of the world, the Jeff Bezoses of the world, and I'm using Musk and Bezos because they don't care. They don't care. They will, they got an escape plan. They not think about none of y'all. In fact, that's all that, all that stuff is noise and a distraction. And if it ever gets too deep, they'll just pull the plug, which is why for me, my sentiment, like John Clark and the people who train me, then thanks to you, we have a place that we can now empty our uh, just a fraction of our resources into. 
to not only sustain and grow this conversation, but out of this conversation in the communities that are blooming like a, a whole farm in narrative. People making connections with each other and then connect. This is what I'm already doing. This is what we've been doing for 50 years. This is what I just started thinking about connecting and then moving institution building, joining together things that have been going on for years on a global scale with people who didn't know about those things or who thought they were doing something in isolation. That is the genius of it. And at the same time, here we are. Some of you all are watching this delayed because you come in to YouTube because you may not have the resources or you haven't figured out yet. OK, oh, I'm going to see how long we go before. Well, 2022 is different than 2021. Right? So, I mean, as we thinking about this and my sentiment, like Clark and them is like, look, I went to school. I'm constantly listening. I'm constantly reading. I'm constantly learning. And any way I can facilitate more and more of us doing that i'm going to do it that's just my temperament i was trained that way and it's my it's my it's also my you know kind of personality at the same time if this thing gets out of hand just like they drop a bomb on tulsa in 1921 they just kick you off of youtube some of y'all know the algorithm don't follow us but guess what we got somewhere else now in fact we got somewhere now self-determination kuji chagalia Cooperative economics, Ujima, collective work and response. I'm sorry, Ujima, co cooperative. In fact, it's interesting in Kiswahili, even the principles of Kwanzaa don't necessarily translate literally into that. So he's talking about economics. You know, he's talking about cooperative economics, Ujima. It's almost like, I, and I'm trying, my, my, my key Swahili is rusty in part because I never took a class. I've had to look words up and then been in conversation to ask people. I think Jama means family or something, because even that, even Okonomiya in the Greek, I know I've studied more Greek than key Swahili, unfortunately, but this guy has Theophilo Benga, who, you know, was always like, nah, y'all be using these words, you don't know where they came from. Okonomiya, memory serves and correct me, in Attic Greek speaks to the question of household. Some people say home economics, you're being redundant. Economics mean home, mean family. I mean, so economy really is about the use of resources by the group. Mm. So it's very important. Even Ujama doesn't mean cooperative economics as much as it means what are we doing? How is your labor being used for the family? You know what I'm saying? So it's very African for uh, when these young brothers and sisters get drafted and go to the league, go to the WNBA or the NBA, really the NBA, because they still ain't paying WNBA like they should. But, and they say, okay, first thing I'm gonna do is take care of my family. And then the social structure, and you know this, oh my God. In fact, I wonder if you could quickly recall some of, or one of the, or a couple of the worst things you ever heard in terms of criticisms of black athletes, black professional athletes who had large numbers of their friends in their entourage. Mm -hmm. that's an African thing though look y'all ain't got we was together what you think I'm gonna lead these cats because I grew to six seven and got a nice jumper no he's my man's it's my man's right here and of course with Rich Paul and them coming in it's getting really getting real nervous about this at this point because now it ain't just like y'all hitting me off with a check whatever no I want my boy to be the agent my girl over here she my lawyer he's my accountant this sis over here does my public what the hell y'all doing oh we gotta come up with some rules no, we got some new NC2A. Uh, you wait, hold on. Y'all are so different. You're from the South. You're from Chicago. Man. Yeah, but where y'all going? We going to the unified meeting. That's called slave labor. <laughs> so <laughs> look, this is what we're going to do. NC2A, get in get in the, with the NBA. We got to keep Rich Paul out of this. So say you got to have a degree. Get it. And then them cats is like, okay, so how about we're going to flex? And then they had to back up off that. But my point is this. As we're talking about what's going on in Chile, this is a country level reimagining potentially of what it means to be a country unlike the united states of america which will cling to this raggedy ass 18th century constantly amended constitution even when people don't go by their own rules because what happened last year you watch the supreme court of the united states tell the state of texas we know this is unconstitutional go with god because we can count we got the handmaid, we got Justice Beer, we got Justice McConnell Gorsuch, and now we got the numbers. It ain't no rules. Stop us. Stop us until you can stop Wilt Chamberlain in the paint 
he going to dunk on you, score 100 points, and average 55 rebounds. The only way he's going to stop Will Chamberlain is find somebody big as him or find out some kind of way to double team come with a game straight because there ain't no rules. Now, you could change the rules and say no dunks. You could change the rules and widen the lane, and you might be able to contain them. You might not. But as in the case of Chamberlain arguing with Michael Jordan, they say when they had the uh, all-time 50 greatest, 100 greatest NBA players, and they saw Jordan over there arguing with Bill Chamberlain about who was the greatest, and finally Bill Chamberlain said to Michael Jordan, look, man, you, when you was playing, they... Uh, you they changed the rules for you when I was playing, they changed the rules to stop me. <laughs> and at that point, Jordan couldn't say nothing, you know what I'm saying? But here's the thing they get ready to change the rules in Chile. The markets are nervous because they're gonna take that lithium. Lithium is what powers batteries, so all these uh green cars and all this even stuff like lithium is critical to this process. So they're nervous because Chile is like, in fact, let me just uh, share with you a couple other numbers about Chile right now. They say it's a success because like I think the per capita average in Chile is like $25,000 a person. They say, okay, well, that's good. They're they're a success story in Chile. Yeah, over half the population in Chile exists on the equivalent of about $523 a month. Which means that that twenty five thousand you averaging out when you see per capita income, we know that don't mean nothing. The inequality is rising. So in Chile, they're getting ready to rewrite their constitution, and they have the numbers to do it. And then after they rewrite, it, I think they have uh, six months, if I'm not mistaken. And then they got to put the thing in for uh, after they submit the constitution, they got to call a national referendum. So look in the press for a lot of propaganda, a lot of people saying they're nervous about what's going to happen. Anytime you see the Western press start saying they're nervous, that means that somebody somewhere trying to escape colonialism. Somebody trying to escape imperialism. We're nervous about it. We're nervous about it. You should be nervous because somebody trying to escape from your thought. It's the same language they use when people in the United States get in the street. We're nervous. I mean, this reckoning is not, we're nervous. You should be nervous. You should be nervous. And then there are a couple of things. I think I'm going to say that for Monday, but maybe as we uh, kind of start winding, I want to mention a little about um, a brother who made transition. Um, the last, the third week, third week of December. I want to talk about him a, a little bit before we get out of here. So, okay. Yeah. All um, right. Tell us. Tell us, Doc. <laughs> well, this is a brother. I don't know when. Um, you remember the last time you've been in the Strand Bookstore? Uh, it's it's been, been a while. Yeah, it's been a yeah. while. Yeah, but but you've been there, of course, of course, of course, of course. Right, New Yorkers, New Jersey, East Coast, y'all know. And we used to make pilgrimage to the Strand. In fact, when in fact the Strand was like maybe the Strand might have been the first place I went. The first when I went to New York when I drove my little Ford Escort from Columbus, Ohio. That summer I spent. There and I went to make sure I had a place to stay in Jersey City, and then took my um took my little country behind through the Holland Tunnel. That was <laughs> I was in May 1989, and I came out of Holland Tunnel, and I'm guilty of this. I I will freely admit, Professor Hunter, I'm one of them human beings that constantly looks up and around. You now you tell you don't do that because that's how you know you're a tourist. <laughs> I look up and around everywhere but i am black in the world so i know how to blend in too right I go to kemet i'm gonna wear the gala beer. i'm in south africa i'm gonna get in the thing that you said you would never get into but we'll see because it's just an experience now you know what now you just got you just got fine-tuned like iron man so ain't no sense in you getting in and mm-mm, playing with that but anyway i like you know people call it going native i don't call that going native i call that respect for the culture and also head on a swivel. Why? Because I ain't no fool. I was born in Nashville, but I didn't live most of my life outside the South, between Columbus, which is cool, and Philly for 17 years. So let me be very clear. <laughs> I'm not going to be, you know, got. Not in that respect. But at any rate, came out of the Highland Tunnel. Like, damn, it's New York. And of course, as you know, I mean, but see, you, you're, you're a daughter of the region. You know, New York, to me, is, uh, what did the last poets call it? New York is a metaphor for America. In some ways it is. But at any rate, when the first place, maybe the first place I went was the Strand, the Strand Bookstore. And his brother was there. 
He'd been there for 30 some years before he made transition on December 22nd at his home. He lived in Jersey City. This is a brother named Ben McFall. Ben McFall was the longest tenured bookseller in the history of the Strand Bookstore. He was a kind of butterscotch colored brother, um, bald dome, had hair, you know, encircling the dome. He had these glasses on a string. You know, he had a string on the glasses and he would always have them down like this. You know, looking over the glasses. He's the only employee in the strand. He's a bookseller, book buyer. We, we go in the strand, you come in the front door. And then, of course, there's this organized chaos. <laughs> the, the center aisle with the display books and then all the stacks over here to the right, the bookseller. And you see the big desk there, the people piling in books. Then you keep going toward the back, the art books. I'm thinking about the way it used to be organized. They've moved some stuff around now. And then they sell everything else because they're trying to stay in business, right? I say they're trying to stay in business. They own the building, but that ain't enough, according to the owners, right? Um, uh, now they sell like socks and mugs and all this kind of thing. But it used to be just, just books. And he, all the way in the back is the fiction section. And all the fiction is there in the stacks. And then, of course, you know, my first move would be coming to Strand to this day. I haven't been, of course, in a couple of years. But to this day, you come in the Strand, go to the left, go down the stairs. Why? Because it used to be in the back in the back back was where they had the university press books. And everything was at least half price. Because that's the only way, you, you know, I can't afford the university press books. I've been going there since I was, like I said, I was in law school. So... You know, you go in the back, university press books, the academic books, the nonfiction, sports section, the law section. I'm just looking at any. Of course, when you come down the steps, there's the other buyer table there. And the thing about bookstores is that booksellers who are real, many of my white friends are bookstore people. In fact, before COVID, and I imagine after things loosen up enough for me to travel a little bit, I'll go in bookstores in cities where people think I live in those cities because I'm not going to go into the city and not go into a bookstore. If I go to Powell's in Chicago, Bookhaven in Philadelphia, you know, if I go to these places, these are our friends. In other words, I know them, they know me by name. So we haven't seen you in a while. And sometimes I don't even tell them I don't live there. <laughs> But then they know now because I've taken now to if I go to, to, to the uh, if I go to Powell's or the, the theological seminary in Chicago, I'll buy books and then I'll take out one or two books to keep with me and ship the rest. So now I even know you know, my address is my heart, or I'll send it somewhere, you know. So at any rate, the strand booksellers are, and we, we all know this, booksellers are. Are book booksellers in places like that are book people. They talk books. In other words, the, you, I don't know if you've ever just, as you passing by, listen to book people talk who work in bookstores. It's a different humor. Mm -hmm. It's a, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> it's like, yeah. and, and, and you could get an education just listening to them. Like we talking about, don't look up. If we was walking the basement of the strand right now, and, and these kids, and I'm saying kids now, because most of them 20 something, 30 years old, 20 something, 30 somethings. Because they work in there, they go going to school, they and, and, and the population shifts, but they not you won't make no you won't make no kind of money you working on the floor in the bush like that. These are kids and they talking about and they connecting it to all kind of what's the latest thing in the theater, you know, what books coming out here, or oh, so-and-so called for such and such. Oh boy, here goes so and so. And then you come in, you liable to see anybody come in the strand. Authors of the books, people of how you know, critics and this thing, and, and that's a different kind of energy. And for years, I mean, God knows there's and I've told some of these stories before, and I won't talk about them now. I remember there have been times I walked in the strand and clearly they had acquired an estate or part of an estate, and it was clear. And if you're a book person, you can tell when you run into a theme. You see a book you've been looking for for five or six or ten or fifteen years, you say, wait a minute. If this book is here, that means this other book is here. Then you look, damn, okay, if these two books are here, okay, this is such and such collection. Or this is so and so. And then you start looking and see, that's not, you're not going to find that in one section. Now, if you kind of got a hint as who you think they've got these books from, you start looking in the other sections for copies. So I, I, I didn't go to fiction a lot. Fiction in the back of the strand, before you get to the fiction, is the music. 
and the theater and the culture. I got a copy of Burt Williams, Son of Laughter. I've been looking for that book for many years over there. I mean, so so many other things. And then, of course, the poetry section. I Let me not get into where all these sections are because things change, right? But in the back, though, was fiction. And in the back of fiction, it was a desk. And at that desk, Ben McFall. And I'm going to tell you something. I have a great deal of respect for booksellers and for book people, particularly in bookstores like that. And most of those little stores I used to go to, gone now in the village, go uptown, those bookstores, gone. I mean, Harlem, you know, Una, I was, I would sit there. Well, anyway, mm, I'm bringing back memories now. Liberation Bookstore. Yep. They ain't there no more. Remember when Human Man came. But anyway, that's a whole nother thing. Because it ain't there no more either. I just missed Mr. Misho and them guys, but I, but so many people I knew who knew them. Mm-hmm. Uh, 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 Misho's bookstore, and, and then of course uh, the great Jamaican um, Richard B. Moore. Anyway, he had his bookstore, Fred Douglas bookstore, all those books. I mean, I I wasn't of that generation, but I was fortunate enough to be. I'm old enough, and I spent enough time with people who were of that generation to recreate that in my mind. And so I feel like every you should spend time in bookstores with people. So anyway, I go in the strand, and I. I rarely talk to McFall, to, to Brother Ben, but because I ain't like to bother him. My 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 strategy in bookstores is I'm gonna look for what I'm looking for. I ain't gonna ask nobody because that's how you learn a bookstore. You go through and look, and if I can't find it, or if I think there's something I might have missed, or if I think you got something back there behind you that you ain't put on the shelf yet, or if I think you make, t- then I'll ask you a question. And you can tell, like in any other conversation, by the questions people ask, how serious they are sometimes. And so my conversations with Ben McFall over the years were short to the point, And he had a style that was, I mean, I don't can't think of an equivalent in jazz, maybe McCoy Tyner, maybe, you know, sometimes it was percussive, like a Thelonious Monk, where you it, like, you know, I'm looking for, for example, you ain't never going to find, rarely find Chance to Williams, any of his fiction. Chance to Williams, in fact, these are, two of his books of fiction this is his book have you been to the river this is this is a rewriting if you read invisible man you should get chance to williams have you been to the river it's incredibly hard to find um but and i'll i'll I'll, I'll resist the urge to go and get the raven which is his first novel this was his last novel which basically is a novel of reconstruction a historical novel the second agreement with hell these are hard books to find. But if you're in a bookstore looking for black books and just go to the black book section, you fail. Go to the fiction section. These are novels. You're not going to find them in the black section unless the bookseller knows it's by a black person. But his first novel, The Raven, which is a riff on Edgar Allan Poe, you wouldn't know Chance Williams was black. There's no picture on the cover. So you probably put that in the fiction. So I would always go in the fiction section looking for things that black people wrote or other people wrote who I'm, that I'm interested in. That would be there that you might not think, not just Tony Cade or you know, you know, Tony Morrison and them. They had a rare books upstairs anyway. But Chance of Williams, let me see, can I find I never found Chance of Williams in the strand, but I found other things there. Wilson Harris, very important writer, fiction writer, essayist out of the Caribbean, Ghana, actually. And so I'm looking, you know, and I always keep in my in my mind a list of writers I'm looking for at the time. And there was a time when I was on the uh Wilson Harris, Kamal Braithwaite, uh um Mackey. Uh, we were talking about Mackey because he used to go with Bell Hooks when they were at Stanford, right? Um, um, Nathaniel Mackey. I was on that kick, right? So I'm collecting as much as I finally got just about everything. So I would uh, see him, and I didn't know his name for a long time, but I but I watched him, and that's how I learned his name because, you know, it's mostly white booksellers. Number one, black booksellers are rare. You know, so I go into Bridge Street Books here in Georgetown, my man Joe over there you know these cats are knowledgeable when you see a black bookseller who knows books it is a particular delight because here's the thing about it academics tend to be narrow and have been coming more and more john clark new stuff across the range that's what made his genius so important st Clair drake new stuff across the range du bois new stuff across the range they knew things across the range now people get real narrow and they talk to people who are doing what they're doing. And so you see, they don't have the comparative capacity compared. One of the things that in this, uh, I'm going to leave that 1619 thing alone. I think we may come back Monday on that because I really want to dig deep into Oak's criticisms because some stuff is fair. Some stuff isn't. And I think we should spend some time on it. And I'm not going to say what I was about to say, but narrow booksellers. I mean, expert booksellers. 
you go there, you will have your ability broadened to understand. The best booksellers are better than many college professors. And Ben McFall, who was 73 years old when he made transition, um, had pulmonary fibrosis. Ben McFall, who came out of Detroit, actually. Uh, ben McFall, who um, whose parents were school teachers in Detroit. Um, ben McFall, who came to New York in 1978. And Fred Bass, who owned the Strand bookstore at the time, interviewed him and hired him on the spot. He had been there from 1978 until now. Ben McFall, who was the only buyer at the Strand who had his own desk. So when you went back to that desk, Ben desk. But you would see him, he was almost like a um, like a monarch of sorts. The white kids, all the white people, oh, Ben, so, 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 so. If you could talk to him, people come in looking just for him. They're going to ask him questions. You know how some people are. They ain't going to look for nothing. They're going straight to him. Okay, that's cool. I'm not that guy. I'm one of them people who will watch forever just to be in the same space. And so when I first came, started going in there, I said, who is this guy? Man, it's a black dude. And they had black employees, but they used to be younger. Who is this Ben? Ben? Oh, Ben, so, 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 so. They're checking jokes and he cracked jokes. And so, okay. <laughs> This dude is uh is interesting. And so one day I went in there and I forget even who I was asking about in the fiction. And I couldn't find anything. And I asked him and he never even, he kind of glanced and then went back to what he was doing because he was good for that. He talked to you and I look at you, not out of disrespect because he could do about four times things at the same time. Well, so, 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 did you check something? Yeah, you check something? Okay, that's interesting. I don't think we have a copy of anything by them in in the last couple of years, it's interesting. I mean, are you interested in that? And he looked at me. Yeah. <laughs> Where are you from? Oh, I came up when I live in Philly. Oh, that's very interesting. And everything. And then since then, when I was going to the bookstore, it was him and his brother who was a Jamaican cat. I love that brother, the security guard. He moved into another administrator. He got into an administrative position in the strand. Every time I go in there, hey, man, how you doing? Him and Ben, you just nod and keep going. And it's like, because black booksellers, they there to sell books and they there in the ecosystem. And they, but when they see black book people, they take a particular joy in that. And so uh, I want to lift him up because he uh, he's going to be uh, cremated. His ashes, uh, he's going to go home to Detroit. He's going to be buried next to uh, Tim Pollock. Uh, who we call the love of his life. Uh, that brother uh, made transition from uh, AIDS in 1985. And, you know, COVID, one of the things that COVID robbed us of is seeing him. He was sick toward the end, really. And so he didn't, you know, going back and forth, particularly during COVID. But that's one kind of want to miss him. I want to bring him up because, you know, for all of the celebrities whose names we know, you know, most of the living and dying we do in the world is done with others who are closer to us, who are closer to who are legends and institutions and the most meaningful people in our lives who never uh, are known beyond those communities. And Ben McFall is not necessarily one of those people. He had a long obituary in the New York Times. They did profiles of him before he was beloved. But in the governance structure, who are African people to each other? There would be no reason for the times to talk about him in the context of what he was as a black man in that position to another black man and the black people. So I wanted to raise his name. That's beautiful. <laughs> yes. And that's that's the way it should be done, you know. So we'll never ever forget that man will always be alive. And thank you. Uh, because I didn't have the pleasure, even though I've been in Strand many times to to know and meet this man. I, I guarantee you saw him. In a minute, you could because he was almost invisible. You wouldn't, he just slipped through he's a little thin dude. He'd be in the minute. You wouldn't, but if you saw you may you may be sitting somewhere a month from now, a year from now, or we'd be sitting by the now or somebody. Oh, did he used to wear a vest? I seen that guy. I mean, he was because he, he wouldn't, he, you know, he wouldn't bother you. You would have to he was just very unobtrusive. I can't, I can't wait to sit by the Nile with you. By the We're going to have yes. a look. the Nile is there. It's been there. Going to be there. COVID, they can't do nothing to it. I cannot wait. 
2022 mm. is bringing some great things. And, and for everyone in Nubia, you're a member of Narrative, which means that you have access to this amazing bookstore directory that uh, we have assembled. I think it is the most comprehensive Black-owned bookstore uh, directory anywhere in the world. So yes. just go to resources on, yes. at the main page of Narrative. I know more people are in Nubia. You spend more time in Nubia. But Narrative is where, uh, you know, you're going to get your resources like, you know, Souls of Black Folk and and all of the books that we're going to be putting in in 2022. So go to resources, click down, and you'll see the bookstore directory where you can find a bookstore in your neighborhood because uh, it's it's that comprehensive. So yes, all right, yes, all right. Yes. So office hours on Monday. Office uh, hours on Monday, and we're going to prep. So if you go to narrative, right? We got this. The uh, the miseducation Negro is there. Yeah. Yes. Exactly, exactly. So the miseducation of the Negro, y'all make sure you go to narrative you Nubia because not Monday, but the following Monday, we are going to start. And I think Professor Hunter, he has been on my mind so much. He stays on my mind. I'm thinking we might have to slot in the wrong minute after that. Maybe Black Power USA. Like that. Uh, if there's a country, I don't see, I don't know. I'm, 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 I ain't going nowhere on the 6th of January because see, you know, these nationalists are real clear about their holidays. Yeah. yeah. Yes, they are. And yeah. we're, but we're also clear and prepared. So uh, that's true. that. Say less, as yeah. you would say. <laughs> uh, tomorrow, Maroon's Medicine Chest uh, will be here. Those of you who care about your health, uh, we should be everybody. I'll see you. Look, y'all playing. What y'all doing at Maroon's Medicine Chest? Y'all trying to save lives. Are you serious right now? And Yada, I mean, so many people want her as their primary care physician. <laughs> She is all of the things. Uh, and thank you for that introduction because no. a lot of what we do is, you know, through you. So I just want to say thank you again. Thank you. Thank for everything. you. Um, and thank the How you feeling? How's it going? How's everything coming? Uh, you know, it's it's tough, but, you know, we are here and we can do all things. So no question. I only bring it up so that all the Nubians can send all that love in the chat. So that mean, means I a lot. It. It's already there. It's there. It's there. It's there. It's there. You know, we love you. So. <laughs> Uh, see everyone in the Nubian streets. God bless everyone. And uh, all right. I'll talk to you later. Dr. See you.